The following is a conversation with Dr. Andrew Morgan. Dr. Morgan was previously Chief Scientist and Fellow at DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences, a global leader in industrial biotechnology and the development of innovative microbiome-based products for the general population. Dr. Morgan currently sits as Chairman of the Innovate UK Knowledge Transfer Network, KTN, Microbiome Special Advisory Group. Dr. Morgan is doing some brilliant things for the microbiome field across the UK. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. So before we started, you were telling me about your worst travel trip ever. Take me back to the start. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So um, I think I was in my late 30s and... Um, we were looking at a, um, a business opportunity in, in Hawaii. Um, they, they have this, uh, these algal culture um, capabilities and technologies there, and they were, they were just developing them. And we were interested in uh, a technology for producing a certain pigment, right? So um, to get there, it's rather, <laughs> as you can imagine, from London, yeah. it's a long way. And I remember flying through San Francisco, San Francisco airport, had to wait there about four hours. I mean, it's already a you know, 12 hour trip, 11, 12 hour trip to San Francisco. Um, four hour wait, and then a, a delayed flight to Ouch. Hawaii. <laughs> Ouch. Arrived at the hotel about 1.30 in the morning, had to meet this guy who was gonna take me out to the big island to look at these ponds uh, where they produce these, these algae. Um, I had to meet him at seven o'clock in the morning. Oh no! Then we had to fly to the Big Island, <laughs> visit the pond, have lots of discussion around the technology and how they were doing all these things. Um, it must then, have been in a daze. Yeah. So that was that was most of the day, and then we flew back to Honolulu in the evening. Um, had dinner together. Beautiful, looking out over the sea and everything. One of you know Hawaii. Yeah. Imagine it. Um, and then took a flight, an overnight flight back to San Francisco um, at, I think, 8 o'clock in the morning. I was visiting our facility in South San Francisco. <laughs> um, and um, for, for meetings all day. Oh, my goodness. Dinner in the evening. Got on a plane. <laughs> wow. And flew to Chicago, where I slept for two hours in a hotel. And then I took a flight up to Madison. Oh, this is insane. Yeah, this was totally it's, insane. We're still it's going. Like, yeah. We're still going. <laughs> yeah, I'm still going. And <laughs> I thought it was going to stop at Hawaii. No, no. But, and then yeah. um, visited a biotech company in Madison that we, we were having conversations with. Uh, spent the whole day there. <laughs> Flew back to Chicago. Got on an overnight flight back to London. Oh, my goodness. And then I was... The, I went down with flu about two days later. Oh, yeah. And I was ill for two, three weeks. Yeah. Worst flu I ever had. Right. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about how your immune system, yeah. you know, how your body kind of copes with um, this, with travel and, and differences in time zones and all that kind of stuff. And I learned a, <laughs> a lesson there. Yeah. Um, and I never did that again. I did a few other foolish things in my career, of course. <laughs> oh, we should talk. <laughs> we should talk about those. <laughs> but this, now, that was the worst trip I ever did. But I never tried to do back to back um, overnights or red eyes, as yeah. they like to call them in the US. It, yeah. it it wrecks havoc on everything, doesn't it? Yeah, totally. And totally. also, you're not eating like what you normally would eat as well. Think about how many bugs you're getting exposed to in all yep. the various different planes. Yes, yes. And yeah, the, the lack of sleep as well. Yep. I mean, sleep's so important, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I, I was saying, I, I, in some respects, feel like I get hauled every week now because I don't do the doctor stuff anymore. <laughs> right. And there was a period of time where I, I was I was doing night shift, night shift, night shift, never more than three because I was a less than full-time employee and my colleagues had to do four or more. Um, and then I would I, I would come in from uh, the NHS shift, have a shower, get my suit on, so scrubs off, suit on, shave everything, and then I'd be on a plane to one of the conferences to do, to do some BD. And um, 
in in retrospect in hindsight i i don't know how i managed to do that yeah. for so long because yeah. looking back at it it feels like that's that would be impossible but yeah. but it kind of happened yeah and then the, le the lesson for me is that whilst i kind of felt okay i think for most of that year and a bit mm. it really was it was more than a year because I started the company um, when I was at medical school, but I was not at my best in terms of physical and probably mental health as well. Yeah. Because I was just burning the candle at both ends for too long. Yeah. You can't do it. On on the on the jet lag thing, I think the bugs have a a, a rhythm, don't they? The mm. bugs in your gut have a rhythm. Oh, yes. And 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 jet lag does have an impact on the microbiome. Yeah. So I, I brought us back now to right. <laughs> to the gut and and, and microbiome, but. You've had an incredibly interesting career. Can you take me back to the start and and walk me through? How you far know? do you want to go back? Well, go go right back to the start. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We could. Um, do you want to start school days or? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All sure. Right. Um, so, I was born in London. I was brought up in North East Essex. Um, I went to the local grammar school in a town called Clacton. Um, which is, was a nice little seaside town at the time. Um, I, I had a lovely time at the grammar school. I'd already started to get interested in nature, bird watching. Uh, we could say natural sciences in a way. I was interested in astronomy as well. But I got interested in, in uh, biology. And a cousin of mine gave me a chemistry set at the age of about nine, um, and I did all sorts of weird and wonderful things <laughs> with that and blew things up. Nice. And, you know, I guess. and I got interested a bit in chemistry. But biology was sort of my overriding interest and passion. And I kind of, you know, did really well in it. You know, it, it, like if you're interested in anything, it's, you know, it's, it comes easy. Um, and at, I think it was about the age of 16. Um, low, Lower sixth, as we used to call it. I don't know whether they still call it that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, Scotland, it's, it, it, it's changed, yeah, yeah, and it continues to change. Also, the exam names change. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not fully up to speed. I don't know, but I know what right. you're talking about. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I was around 16 years old. Um, and um, they organized, the school organized for a few of us to go to the local technical college for the day in Colchester. Um, where we we had a, co a a day's course, if you like, whoops, um, on microbiology. Ah, yeah. And this was fascinating. I really enjoyed the day. And the teacher was one of those sort of teachers who, you know, they, they're they're quite well, they're not not extremely rare, but I think there's a rare breed of teacher that can really inspire you. You know, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's a um, gift, isn't he was, it? He was one of those gifted, yeah, kinds. And he um, he taught us about microbiology, um, just some basics, of course. It was just one day, uh, but he also um, said we should read a book. It was called Microbes and Man. Yeah. Right. And um, I think you might have heard me talk about that book before. I, I, I'm not sure I have, and, and I, I also, I'll, I'll be honest, I've not read it's, that well, book. It's, it's really, I mean, this, this is all this is such a long time. There'll ago. be nothing this in the microbiome in uh, microbe and man. Certainly not. No, 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 no. 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 But I read this book. Uh, and I was really fascinated by, you know, it was really about the way in which microbes, in, you know, are all around us and impinge on our lives, yeah. important for industry, important for health and all sorts of things. Um, and, and, and that really, and it was written by a chap called John Postgate, who was professor of microbiology at the University of Sussex, which is a new university at the time. And, and I was just thought this was, this is fantastic, right? And he was heading up something called the unit of nitrogen fixation, which was based, okay. on, based on, uh, at the time. Um, and th I've then reading all sorts of stuff. I, I read the Theory of Evolution by John Maynard Smith. He was also at Sussex, right? So I got this idea that Sussex yeah. might be a good place for me to go, and that's actually what I did, basically. You went to Sussex. <laughs> I went to Sussex, um, but I went there, you know, more. I think in a, in a way a little bit more um, influenced by these professors than perhaps some of my colleagues who were just sort of listing, you know, universities and, you know, um, based on reputation or whatever. Um, Sussex was very new and an exciting place to be at the time, actually, um, and, um, and very highly ranked for biological sciences at the time. And biochemistry, you probably know, there were several Nobel Prizes that, that came out of there in chemistry. Is that right? Yeah. And I, I actually... 
I was taught by one of those guys, just, you know, just in a tutorial <laughs> once a week. So. Wow. <laughs> but nothing, nothing more than that. But anyway. That's cool. Had the, uh, had the chance of rubbing shoulders with one of those guys. Really cool. But that, that's, that's, but I went to study biology initially because I didn't want to sort of narrow the, um, the scope of what, you know, of what I wanted to learn at the time. Um, but I narrowed it within two terms to biochemistry. Right? So, because the chemistry was just amazing mm. and I was sort of felt sort of uplifted by that. And I thought biochemistry, I'm probably likely to get a, a, a you know, a better job if I get back to a biochemistry. Good results, yeah. yeah. Than, than a biology degree. I don't know whether that's true, but that's what I thought at the time. So I switched and it was no problem switching because it was actually the same course for the first two terms anyway. So, um, so you know, I went on to um, uh, get a biochemistry degree, a good, good class of degree. Um, uh, then I had to choose where I was going to go next. Um, and um, some of my professors wanted me to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Right. I was kind of, you know, doing reasonably well. Um, and I actually did get offered places at Oxford and Cambridge, actually, for postgraduate degrees. But um, I, my background was such that none of my, none of my family had been to university. So I, I wasn't sure <laughs> that that was the right place for me. Right. right? You know, I didn't really have the confidence if you like, right. to do it, uh, to be honest, honest and frank with you. Right. So, so I actually just stayed at Sussex and I, I, I worked on um, a great project on, on yeast. Um, at the time, it was, it was a protoplast fusion technology. What does that mean? Um, so the, you strip the cell walls off of yeast and you stick them together and the genetic contents <laughs> fuse. They just merge together? And you can hybridize yeast strains oh. that way. Okay. Even cross species, actually. Really? How does that work? <laughs> well, basically, if they're close, close, if they're you know closely related, you can actually sometimes oh. hybridize them. I mean, you might argue actually. And can they replicate further, or do they stop? In some cases, yes. Wow. In some cases, um, they sort themselves out. Quite literally. <laughs> I mean, they throw really? out chromosomes and, and yeah, yeah. Wow. And we. How did? <laughs> Maybe this is an impossible question to answer, right? But. How do they just ping out the stuff that shouldn't be in there? Well, or, of course, you'd have to follow the mechanism. You know, don't, we didn't really have the tools to do that kind of stuff. Right. In actual fact, we were studying mitochondrial transmission um, through this mechanism. This is cool. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and, and they certainly segregate, which they do normally. So, you know, multiple copies of mitochondria in a yeast cell, right. you put two together or three together, because actually you can't control how many fuse together in this sort of... A mechan you know, this sort of chemically induced fusion it, process. It just happens almost just randomly. Happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what I found actually with the species that I was working with, um, which was Clivromyces lactis, which you might never have heard of. But it's a, I have not heard of that. It's a yeast no. associated with dairy, as lactis. You know, Got lactose. it. Um, but the reason we were studying it, it had a mitochondrial genome closer, to, at least closer to the size of the human mitochondrial genome. So that there was a sort of an argument that perhaps this might be more representative if you wanted a model system. Um, I don't know how, you know, that, I think I might have been stretching it, to be honest, but uh, compared to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the standard baker's or brewer's, brewer's use. The workhorse. The workhorse. But it also uh, couldn't survive without a functional mitochondrial genome. You, if you eliminated the mitochondrial genome, which you could do quite selectively, um, in, a, in a yeast cell, in, in this Clivromyces lactis petite negative species, you, it, it wouldn't grow. It would be the cells would be metabolically active, but they couldn't do couldn't do anything. Interesting, right? They couldn't actually replicate. Whereas where Saccharomyces cerevisiae can wipe out its mitochondrial DNA and still keep going. Right? Yeah, through, through, <laughs> right. I thought it would need its DNA to no, kind of keep. It uses a glycolytic pathway then to derive its energy. Wow. Yeah. Um, so yeast is an incredible thing, isn't yeast it? Yeast is incredible, and and it's um, it's the kind of I mean, it's been a model. It has actually proved itself to be a model system. I think Paul Nurse, I know Paul Nurse was uh, using Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is another species I also worked with a little bit. Um, uh, borrowed the system from from Paul actually, who was at Sussex also at a certain point. Is that right? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, and he. Um, he, he was just highly gifted yeast geneticist 
very, I mean, incredibly, I think, just just incredible the work he did. But he did yeast, use yeast as a, as a system that from which he built, you know, his um, his career in, into cancer research, right? So yeast is a great model system. One of the most kind of cool and interesting things about yeast. <laughs> the, the coolest, well, I tell you what, when you work on yeast, at least in the days that I was doing this, and we're talking about the 70s, um, you get associated with the brewing industry <laughs> quite easily. Uh, there was a place called the Brewing Research Foundation. Uh, uh, I don't know, I'm not even sure it exists today, but it had its own research program, its own yeah. research laboratories. It was in Surrey. Um, and they organized great conferences. And, and, and actually, if you ever went to a conference on yeast, uh, biochemistry, genetics, or whatever, You'd always got guys from the brewing industry there. It was great fun. Got it. <laughs> um, you know, and of course, it's it's. I mean, yeast is used for so many different things these days. It's also used as a as a production system for you know producing different kinds of uh, recombinant medicines. Uh, nowadays, it wasn't in those days. This technique I used was actually <laughs> predated a technique for getting DNA into right. yeast, right. transforming it. Right. I mean, that, I'm, I'm that old. The, <laughs> the yeast transformation had not occurred. A, a lot of people <laughs> will have heard of yeast in the context of brewing and baking, but yeah. they wouldn't have heard it in the context of medicines manufacture. Right. It's not an area I'm actually massively familiar with either. Right. So, right. so what, what happens? Well, you can use uh, yeast and fungi, and of course bacteria, um, but different kinds of yeast. You can use them as production organisms or host production or host expression organisms for producing different kinds of recombinant protein um, or for metabolic pathway engineering to produce specific molecules other than proteins. Cool. You know? And so they're actually used industrially to produce specific chemicals, if you like, or biochemicals to be more precise, uh, but also recombinant proteins. Other organisms are used more often to produce industrial proteins like industrial enzymes, like filamentous fungi fantastic at secreting proteins just naturally and so you can sort of um, you can sort of adopt that, that 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 form of metabolism to then be able to produce enzymes uh, you know the kinds of yields uh, and productivity that you need to be able to produce them cost effectively amazing um, so and enzymes is an area I got into later in my career actually we're gonna get there so they're like they're like um Little biological chemical factories. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Is that one way to think about them? Yeah, they just pump out all this great stuff. Pump and, out, and you and the thing about um, engineering, you know, right. with modern molecular biology, um, is that you you can tailor them to really um, produce one. You know, you could say one particular molecule of very high yield and productivity you know, at the expense of everything else. So they, they, right. they they're quite literally incredible designed. To, to, trans, to convert glucose, the sugar, for example, which is typically you know, what they're grown on, um, into this into your molecule of choice. Wow. And ethanol, of course, is one of them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. Which is, of course, yeah. the product of <laughs> beer and wine. But it's, but it's also the product for... Uh, uh, bio, you know, of course, it's also an industrial product used as a biofuel these days. Right. Um, and actually, that's where I started my industrial career. With my, my industrial research career started with um, BP. Right? Yeah. It was a company, I'm sure a lot of people don't know this actually, but companies like BP, Shell, and actually I think most of the major oil, or, you know, what we regard as energy giants these days, they were um, highly diversified at the time that I joined. Right? So... I was recruited to work for BP in their biological sciences division. Wow. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> which, was, which was in Sunbury. I really can't believe that. At the BP Research Center in Sunbury on Thames. Goodness me. Which was Europe's largest private research center at the time. Wow. Yeah. There was something like 700 PhDs there. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is... This is serious. Serious and forgotten history. Really, really serious R and D. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, BP had been one of the companies that, that had, had been trying to develop single cell protein, right? Um, 
uh, based on a yeast. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, and for a whole, I'm going to cut a lot of the story out here as we probably talk with the rest of the yep. <laughs> podcast on, yep. on this topic alone. But single cell protein, there was, a, there was something called the Green Revolution, right, in the 60s, in, uh, running into the 70s, which was a transformation of agriculture. Um, and actually, there was a dire need for it at the time because, unfortunately, there were people starving in in India and other places. Um, and um, a, a chap called Norman Borlag, I don't know if you've ever heard his name, no. was actually a, a DuPonter, as it happened. He was the, the guy who was credited with pretty much driving the solutions for this, um, wow. which is... A, variety of changes in agricultural practice and, and varieties of different kinds of um, cereal crops and the like. Um, <clears throat> but this green revolution, it's kind of, because of this situation, had spurred development of single cell protein as a potential source of nu nutrition. And single cell protein, is, as the name suggests, is actually single cells, cell-based, i.e., in this case, microbial-based um, uh, protein. You simply grow it in huge wow. fermenters on different kinds of substrate. Yeah. Um, and BP was one of the powerhouses for this. And then actually developed this whole process for producing single-cell protein That's incredible. based on a certain type of yeast. It wasn't Clypromycin's lactis, by the way. It was something else. Um, but in 19... I think it was 74... Um, I can't remember. I don't know why I'm looking at you asking. You, you're not <laughs> slightly, pre <laughs> slightly predated my time. <laughs> um, but in 1974, there was the first, I don't know whether it was necessarily the first, but the first major oil crisis where the, um, uh, the price of oil went up. And Due to lack of supply or...? Uh, it was, I think it was a variety of factors, right. constrained <laughs> supply right. in some ways. Right. Um, the, uh, but almost coincidental, co coincidentally, there was a drop in the price of soybean protein. Soybean production was really taking off, and the price of soybean protein was coming down. The soybean was used as a food, or was it yeah, a, a component of various different things as well? So soybean was um, used for a variety of things, actually, but it's, it's a source of, obviously, of, of oil yeah. for, for cooking and the like. Um, but the protein um, is also a very good source of protein for animal nutrition right. and was becoming starting to become an interesting protein for human nutrition. And right. are, were there and are there companies who specialise in growing things like soybean and then processing them to various different levels, if you like, and then distributing them? Yeah, the... The, the the industry tends to be so you have more the growers yeah and then then the processors yep right um, they may I guess they might in some cases be one and the same but and then you've got the, post processing and then product. you've got post yeah so you you extract proteins yep. and and and, and pu purify them so you've got different grades and in some cases you hydrolyze them with enzymes uh, to okay. produce more digestible um, types of, of product. Uh, so, um, but it, but this because BP's process was has based on an oil fraction, and it's um, and the price of soybean, it was it, unfortunately it, it meant they couldn't really go any further with a single cell protein right project. But it also so some of the funding started to dry up because there was an oil. Well, the the, the company seven hundred PhD students is a lot. Yeah, this was not this was isn't not, it? This is not in biological science. Right, it was in all facets of the serious engine of, of yeah. productivity. But yeah. BP was one of the pioneers of this single cell protein, as and ICI was also developing it. Right, um, uh, and 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 various other companies were, were pursuing this actually, um, but the because of this, it really brought single cell protein development to an end. <laughs> you know. Um, which sometimes uh, I sometimes come back to it and think it's still quite a neat idea actually. Yeah. Uh, but but it's you know it has to compete with agriculturally produced uh, protein sources, whether whether that's um, you know plant sources or or, or, or meat, effectively, right. or eggs or um, what have you. And the single the sort of um, the proteins that came out of the single cells, how complex could they be? Well, 
the um, it depended if they were processed or whether it was simply sort of dried microbial Got it. biomass. Turned out this particular protein they were producing was really good for animal nutrition. Actually. Ah, really outstanding! Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> So it had lots of the amino acids required. Yep. And, oh, yep. interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you know, and um, so it's so cool that a microscopic thing that you can't see can yep. assemble everything in such a way within its cell membrane, so that it becomes something that's highly nutritious. Uh, absolutely. For a more complicated life yeah, form. And, yeah, and it's, it's fantastic. You know, and also accumulates different kinds of you know. Um, Vitamins and in some cases, oh. are, uh, you know, captures minerals and things. So they Brilliant. can be, yeah. Um, but sort of back to the yes. This, <laughs> so I was a yeast geneticist, biochemist, molecular, you know, starting to become a molecular biologist, right. um, uh, and that's really why they took me on because they had a lot of yeast capability, but they were lacking this uh, this genetics or molecular. Bi- biology capability and that's why they took me on actually um and my first project was really on a biofuels project to en- to to engineer yeast you, you can't imagine how difficult it was to do genetic engineering in those days what and tools we, did you have was there a toolkit at all yeah yeah you know we had restriction enzymes we could extract dna but typically we, we were doing ultra centrifugation and you know season chloride gradients and oh you can't imagine how difficult compared to today very crude tools yeah, because oh, yeah. these days we can go right in and just knock out the most. Oh yeah, you know it's incredible precision. Camp, uh, absolutely. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. we got a bit more precise, and, and DNA sequencing came in yes. you know, during the time I was there. Um, but right at the start of it, it was very, very hard and just took so long. But I was really excited by it. You know, right. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, so you know, the project was to try and produce a yeast that could use. Um, silos, which is one of the main sugars in in straw and the gas, you know, these waste right. agricultural products that are very often just burnt, right, or were at least in those days. Really? Yeah, straw. I mean, you're losing all that goodness potentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, could you convert straw into bioethanol? Right. Right, and bioethanol is then used as a fuel. Then used as fuel. Right. Um, That's cool. And and that was my first project. It was really hard, um, and. It didn't work, basically. Um, even, even though, even though it was actually, you can't can't imagine this, James. This is a single gene change that's required. Is that it? Yeah. We now know that today. No, we knew it then. Oh, we knew it then. Yeah, right. Yeah, but we couldn't get the gene to express, and uh, we couldn't. We didn't. That's where we kind of, you know, we just couldn't couldn't get it to work. Um, so we, in fact, I requested to bring the project to a close right? oh yeah now this is you know when you think about innovation and yeah. management of innovation one of the hardest things for a scientist is to close the project yeah. and you speak to an entrepreneur and they say never ever 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 give up and that's no. what i'd say to you never ever 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 give yeah. up yeah right but it's tattooed on i'm joking it's not <laughs> <laughs> but in but in um uh, in, in in industry Right. When you're managing all sorts of different projects and you've got multiple different kinds of projects that you can choose to fund, right? Um, you do, unfortunately, have to sort of kill fast. Actually. Yep. So projects fail fast. And fail fail fast. fast. I, I, absolutely. So th- this is something I learned very early on. I'm, I'm not saying I was necessarily really ever really good at you know, doing it because it's, you know, projects become it's hard. hard personal of course but um on this particular one i was right because nobody and there were several groups trying to do the same thing solves this for 20 more years is that right <laughs> yeah yeah oh, so you could have been toiling away for i could have been tw- i could have been toiling away for 20 why was years. it so hard i don't know in the end i, I kind of lost track of yeah. the whole thing actually because i moved you, you, you know, moved on yeah. i moved on um but it was solved by a group at i think it was delft university uh, 20 years later great um uh, so and now we can convert the straw now you can convert the straw fantastic yeah fantastic <laughs> so is your view then as as an expert in 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 all of this it's very interdisciplinary actually what you're talking about almost all waste can become something else if we just know enough about the waste oh yeah, yeah pretty much 
Yeah. I yeah. Mean, look at what we do. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, collect, we collect stool samples and we're turning it into a medicine. Very good point. Um, Very good uh, point. But, but uh, yes, indeed. Uh, um, yeah. uh, and there's a lot of value, I think, for the world mm. in the circular economy and, and, and making sure Absolutely. that, you know, instead of just throwing something out and nature doing its thing, and sometimes it takes so long for nature to do its thing, mm. we accelerate whatever process is there and maybe change it a little bit so that the outputs are beneficial to mankind yeah. and the environment more generally. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you decided to, to to kill the project, yeah. which, which as you say is hard. It is hard. And that sounds like it's a theme that's kind of stuck with you as you've become more and more involved in innovation and management of resource. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that's, um, as, yeah. Uh, absolutely. You you really have to know when is the time to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's always hard for the scientists doing the projects, and that was me at the time, um, together with a technician, just myself and a technician at the time. And we, but you know, I, th I think we were doing a pretty decent job to be be honest. But clearly, it was a difficult problem. But I, but I also saw another opportunity. So it's again this thing about you know you can choose where to invest. Yeah. There was a new opportunity emerging. Um, and, and, and BP had a fantastic group uh, working in the area of uh, plant sciences at the time, as did, as did Shell, as did other majors. Again, this type, you know, this is probably not known I'm by so many confused, people. confused. Yeah. They, <laughs> they were very big in agriculture, right? Really? Yeah. In uh, seed companies, so in plant breeding. Um, wow. But, but also in animal nutrition. BP was the largest animal nutrition company in the world. Whoa! <laughs> I'm, I'm, my mind's been blown a little bit. Yeah. I'm not going to lie because I know these names. My my father worked in the oil and gas industry for his career, and right. I hear these names and I think mm. you know, unbelievable engineering uh, and mm. incredible capability relating to how to extract oil and natural gas and process it and mm. so on into in, into outputs that we need mm. and that have catalyzed so much growth economically speaking and, and helped societies develop and so on but i had no idea they had these yeah. other interests yeah. and maybe they still do have some but not to the same level it sounds like yeah absolutely. world leading innovation is what you're describing yeah. at the time yeah and that's, yeah. that's yeah. phenomenal yeah, absolutely but there was a there, 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 this was i can't remember exactly when it was like 1982 or three something like that um, there were a couple of so we we had this fantastic plant sciences group, yep. and what they were very good at was um, propagating plant cells in fermenters. Okay, right? so you could actually grow plants in a single, fermenter, almost like microbes in a fermenter. No, yeah. no way, absolutely. But they don't actually become flowers in the and no, stuff and no, things they, like that. They grow as right? little sort of uh, collections of cells, aggregates of cells, oh. you know, microcalli, um, or in, you know, and and. Basically, they, it looks like a microbial fermentation because you, you can't see. But it's plant know, cells. But it's plant cells growing as li just little collections of cells, little calories. So I guess for the um, listener, fermenter is a, a, a system that you can control. So you can control what goes in and you can control how you pull stuff out and you can control the parameters as well, right? Yeah. And you try and tweak and refine it to propagate the growth of whichever thing is inside. Exactly. And yeah. we spoke, we're speaking about plants now and, yep. and plant cells, but there's also microbial cells. You mentioned the yeast and, yep. and various different others. Yep. And they also now do mammalian cells. Yes. Um, and yep. many drug products are, you Absolutely. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an incredible thing. It is. It's great, great technology. It's serving all sorts of facets of our lives, yeah. particularly medicine, but also agriculture and the like. Yeah. Um, and in this case, of course, you also have to add light <laughs> for plants. Ah, these green. These green fermenters. They're all beautiful. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, this is really cool. Yeah. So, um, so I saw a paper. Um, I can't remember who, which particular group had published it, but there were like a number that came thick and fast at this point on the transformation of plants, getting genes into plants, um, and. This was done, and this is now I just can move into this topic of the microbiome just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So there's, um, there are different soil bacteria that actually naturally transform plants. Did you know huh. that? Really? <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. Okay, so. So I suppose there's a soil microbiome, right? There, of course, yeah. yeah there's, there's a soil microbiome, and we can come back to that later on. Yeah, in, in we should. Context. Yeah, we should because it's really important. Yeah. Uh, but in this, for this 
just to give a bit of explanation for what I actually went on to do was um, I joined the plant sciences team as now as their molecular biologist, their first molecular biologist. Um, my goal was initially, I thought, I'd just like to try this out, what these other guys had done. They'd taken this soil microbiome, like, sorry, my microbe called Agrobacterium tumor fasciens, which naturally infects plants around the crown of the plant, which is where the, the stem meets the root. It's just really, and that's where when a plant is, you know, it's getting bashed by wind, and rain, and small animals or large animals or whatever, sometimes small cracks appear in, you know, at this point right. around the crown. And bacteria find, can find their way in. This particular course. microbe manages to penetrate and actually transfers a chunk of its DNA into, wow. into the plant, into plant cells, those plant cells that it's infecting or transforming, actually. Um, and th this transferred DNA, otherwise known as, believe it or not, tDNA, <laughs> carries genes which form, which promote the cells to grow into kind of a big callus or tumor. And that's why it's called tumor fasciens. Wow. Um, so that, does it like grow over the crack? Yeah, it just sort of, yeah, exactly. So you can see these the kind of balls of, of, of oh, cells, okay. of, of callus type material or tumor like material. I mean, it's, it's a bit gross to call it a tumor, but that's, that's how it was first described. Um, and one of, one of a, a group in the US, um, a group in Belgium, group here in, in Cambridge, UK, had all used slightly different techniques to, I think one, you know, one in the Netherlands too, actually, um, in Germany. They, they were, you know, lots of groups working on the same thing at the same time, but managed to, because you can imagine what, what, where this leads. If you have a bacterium, and actually this, carried, this tDNA is carried on a very large plasmid, right? If you could put something else into that tDNA, yeah. a gene of interest, so to speak, you could transform the plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, not just with the tDNA, but with an additional gene. And, and this, honestly, this was the very first demonstration of plant transformation. Yeah. Plant transformation and, is the, like, how, how do we describe that for the listeners? Like the intentional, go on. Yeah, the intentional introduction of um, of, of of foreign DNA, if you like. There, there are more precise definitions of this. It's a very important definition because yeah. it determines whether an organism becomes a, what's called a genetically modified organism or not. Ah. Right? And that's that's very important from a regulatory standpoint, but but for also for acceptance and all the other issues surrounding, you know, that kind Understood. of technology. Um, but this, this is stuff going on in laboratories and, you know, people just learning how to do these things at the time. Um, I thought this was really cool. Right? We didn't use that term in those days, but uh, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was really amazing, and I was really yeah. excited by it. And I thought yeah. this is kind of what I could bring to this group if if I could sort of learn how to do this. But actually, I chose to go on the one hand a more difficult path, and on the other an easier path. More difficult in that I said no, I didn't want to use Agrobacterium tumor fasciens. I wanted to use a relative. Agrobacterium tumor fasciens called right. rhizogenes. And the reason I wanted to do that was I wanted to do something a little bit different, right? Um, and I also wanted to uh, exploit a phenomenon which made it easier. <laughs> right. Rhizogenes, same kind of system. Bacterium in invades the plant around this crown area, but you don't get this callus produced, you get a bunch of roots just simply grow out in all really? directions. Really? Right? The geotropism goes out the window. Right? These roots grow upwards, outwards, sideways, downwards, whatever. Right? Um, and this is a fa fascinating phenomenon. If you take a slice of carrot and you infect the top of the carrot with this bacterium, you right. get a mass of roots growing out. It's really? beautiful, actually. If you take a piece of stem uh, of a, you know, a, a potato or a tomato or a cucumber or whatever, and you, you, you basically culture it, you know, in aseptic conditions. You've got to surface sterilize it and you inoculate it. Yeah. Just, so you pop it in some agar medium. Yeah. Right. You inoculate the, the exposed cut surface with the bacteria. 
Yeah, wow. Like, looks like a brush with all these really? roots growing out of it. Yes. <laughs> the beauty of this system wow. is you can, most of those roots, um, you can actually isolate and they're already transformed. So you've got a way of identifying your transformed material very easily. Because all the roots have been transformed yeah, by m- the bug. Most. I wouldn't say it's necessarily all because basically what the bacterium is doing is um, introducing root inducing genes. Yeah. And and it's they, they these are plant hormones. Which, and those which genes stimulate are, root growth or got development. It. And it's across all mm. plants that it works or across uh, well it works um predominantly on dicots um as opposed to monoclonal. It doesn't work so it doesn't work. I don't think it works on, on cereal grains. Right. Unfortunately. But it works on, on you know things like um you know tomato and and, and Potato and let's say cu- cucumber, these dicotyledonous plants. Um, and anyway, I must cut a long story short because we'll probably be here for days at <laughs> this rate. That's right. Um, the, Very interesting. The um, what I did was um, I, t- I actually looked at so this group these these colleagues of mine were fabulous. So they had a collection of different kinds of tomato. Had you built that team? No. No, no, this, I was very junior at this right, stage. Right. Um, uh, you know, this is like year three of my, Got it. Yeah, my um, industrial research career. Got it. Right? Um, they, but they, they were very skilled, very nice people to work with, right? And they helped me by providing a whole collection of different germplasm that they had collected. And it just so happened that one of the, tomato varieties it was a wild variety it was at the time it was called lycopersicum pruvianum i think lycopersicum is actually reclassified these days. how do you remember all these names i don't know (laughs) (laughs) i can't can't hardly remember people's names actually but i remember (laughs) stuff like this and plasmid numbers and stuff but anyway um but this this wild tomato so i started inoculating all these different um, you know, and I could see these. You know, she's really how fast were they growing? Quick, really fast. Yeah, quick, I mean, quick. Within a week, you've got you've got roots. Amazing. You could isolate actually. Yeah. In an you know, uh, illuminated incubator. Um, and what I was doing is I was taking a root and putting it then into a liquid culture, or or a solid medium culture to see whether the root would grow. You know, got I, it. I needed a way of for the next yep. step. I would need a way of selecting those that had actually got a new gene introduced if you like um but <laughs> through this process stumbled across across this uh, wild tomato variety that um that actually produced i mean i started w- working just with the untransformed root material right so i took some roots and i tried to culture them um and i left you know this is the thing i just left one of these in the incubator for a few weeks and forgot about it <laughs> and came back and there were these the plant i mean first of all the root had just filled the petri dish really yeah it was in the petri dish it was just round around and around it's just stuffed full of roots it's incredible and not only that i could see small shoots right? ah. and improved the sort of incubation conditions with better light conditions etc and these just grew into plants. This thing naturally really generated itself from root tissue. So this was my best model system to use for this agrobacterium rhizogeny. And of course, I then went on and introduced a foreign gene. Well, first of all, I did the, I took the, I took the wild type, introduced that, got transformed roots, and they regenerated. They didn't look like the original. They, right. <laughs> they, they were, they'd lost apical dominance. They were bushy, whereas of course, tomatoes are vines. Interesting. Yeah, but they lose this. Ap- ap- You're really dominance. tweaking around with nature, right? Yes. But it's a natural phenomenon. You can find tDNA naturally spread in in different plant species. Yeah. Actually, if you just go and look for it, like in tobacco, for example, it's got it's got its own. You know, you just find these genes. So this is something that happens naturally in nature. I take the tDNA element. They like, can't work in a mammalian cell because it's too complicated. No. Yeah. 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 And it's also encoding. They're encoding plant hormones. But I, I became interested. So eventually, of course, I put the foreign gene in, which was just simply an antibiotic resistance gene as a model thing, all, all kept in containment, of course. Um, 
excuse me, and together with folks at the University of Nottingham, which I had a fantastic collaboration with, actually a chap called Mike Davey there, and Bernard Mulligan. Uh, we we <laughs> transformed a whole series of different Solanaceae species, which is which is the potato and tomato type family in the Nicotiana family, um, and regenerated them. But then I set about doing what you were talking about. So now the tools were improving almost yep. every day. So okay, there was a series of genes. In this case, there were two DNA sequences, two T DNA sequences in this rhizogenes. They encoded root-inducing um, uh, uh, genes that produce root, root hormones, if you like, right? Um, or, yeah, root-promoting hormones. Um, but using some, I wouldn't say necessarily fancy genetics, but, you know, laborious genetics at the time, actually, screening through thousands and thousands of transformants, or conjugants, transconjugants, in fact, we... we we managed to knock out genes and look at what happened. Right? So this was in a way a bit of a start to look at how this microbe that lives in a symbiotic... I, I, I regard this more as a symbiotic relationship. That was a question I had. So it's what, not parasitic. No. And so what do the what do the bugs get out of this? Yeah. Right? Um, what do the plants get out of it? Right. It hadn't really been studied, actually. And so it, there were lots of questions floating around, around my mind. Um, the, the bugs get something called, they, they get a carbon and nitrogen source. Yeah. And they, these substances called opines, manapine, agrapine, other kinds of opines, produced, are secreted by, by these roots. And the, and, the, and the microbe feeds off these things. So the root produces some sort of organic compound, these, these allopines? Yep, yep opines. Yep. And the microbe goes, yep, I'll have that. Yep, and that's, okay. that's, that's what it's doing, basically. That's what the, that's what the microbe okay. is yep. trying to get the host to reduced for it um and i'm assuming actually these these adventitious type roots which are very hairy the name is they is regarded as a disease in, of sorts hairy root disease right, right? <laughs> um but we do know that you know the, the, the i mean the massively increased surface area. i wish in medicine we just used words like that we don't we always name it after we always name it after the person that discovered yeah, it true. but it's always very difficult that, that sounds true. just that's very descriptive descriptive and apt hairy root disease right we've all got it yeah <laughs> but um so there may be some benefit for the plant right but it's a very interesting relationship between the microbe and the plant and in a way this is my first sort of thinking about plant microbe or higher organism microbe Yep. relationships actually and we discovered a few interesting things about when we knocked out these genes didn't always do what we thought it would do okay yeah so but that that was my sort of first foray into microbiome if you like of yep. sorts i mean it's you know and at the yeah. time andrew had were people talking about this relationship between microbes and plant or was it yeah yeah actually you know uh, the book john postgate yep right who wrote the microbes and man book right he was heading up this unit called the Nitrogen Fixation Unit, yeah. which is these days actually at uh, John Innes Institute. Um, nitrogen fixation is something that only certain kinds of plants do. Cereal, cereal crops like wheat and maize, barley, whatever, do, are not able to do this, uh, this uh, to, to use this phenomenon. So there are microbes that live in the soil called rhizobia that in fact the roots of plants, and I've, I use in fact, I'm putting little quote, quotation marks around that with my fingers. Yeah. Um, and they um, cause the plant to produce these little nodules. It's kind of a co-development of these nodules by the bacteria in the plant. And the nodules fix atmospheric nitrogen into a nitrogen source for the plant. And this is this is why beans are very good for your, you know, when you, when you, have an allotment, for example, you should rotate your different types of plants, right? And beans will help collect nitrogen into the soil, right? So you don't have to apply a nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is the whole basis of rotational, cr yeah. ro rotating crops. I know right? very, very little about all this, just yeah, so you know. No, I'm okay. very, very, very little, but I'm, I'm, I'm well, deeply interested I, in what I, you're saying. I, I'm not certainly no expert in it myself, but I, I am going to go and buy a book on plant biology because you're you're fascinating me. And what I'm thinking in my head is, 
there must be so many parallels between extracting uh, microorganisms from stool, which is essentially what I've kind of devoted my life to, mm. and extracting organic compounds from plants, extracting beneficial elements from plants, growing plants and turning them into other things. And I'm thinking things like, well, we talk about quality of starting material being fundamental. Well, clearly the quality of your seeds, the quality of everything must be fundamental as well, right? Yes, yes. So absolutely. I'm, I'm fascinated totally. by it. Yeah, totally. You've totally yeah. gripped me on plant <laughs> biology now. Seriously, I'm really, this has been really good. Well, in the in the uh, agricultural industry, they, they actually inoculate plants with these rhizobia. And intentionally? Intentionally. Ah, yeah. Okay. So and, They get and, a pure culture of these bugs and they just spread them on and... Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Wow. So, so th this is a form of fertilization, but it's yeah. a natural form of fertilization. It's, yeah. it's using a system that exists in nature that we've used time, you know, immemorial, if you like, um, by rotating crops, legumes, leguminous crops with other crops, cereal crops, typically beans to cereals. So, someone cereals. at some point in time discovered that if you put a, if you rotate the crops, you get better quality soil, and all your all your plants are better. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And you, you needed to do this every third year or something, I think, was the rule of right. thumb. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's microbes again. Yeah, it's right? bugs. These bugs. And, of course, we, you know, now there's a, quite an industry developing around these inoculants. Um, and So companies are developing inoculants? Yes. Engineered inoculants? And no, to, no. To just naturally derived inoculants wow. that do some wonderful things to plants, whether they fix nitrogen okay. or whether they protect plants from... Um, disease, right, or help um, stimulate plant growth. Yep. We're speaking a lot about the, I've got a mental note to ask you about what makes a great collaboration, because you talked about a good collaboration with Nottingham, I want to get to that, but yeah. can you give me and the listeners some sort of idea about how big the plant industry is? Like how, how big is it, um, it, you know? Yeah, I'm just trying to think if I have a figure in it, I mean, it is colossal. It's colossal. It's, it's colossal because it, you've got your cereals. It's uh, it's. I, I'm. I sh probably should not put a number on it. But okay. You don't have to. But you could talk around it. Think, like think it, about all the things. Well, you know, the, <laughs> the just think about the fact that uh, whatever we eat, nearly whatever we eat, is starting off somewhere in a field, right? So whether you're you're eating um, bread right or you're eating milk milk is produced from a cow that was in a field or and or was eating grains yeah yeah so you, the, the scale of this industry is absolutely huge right yeah right so this is you know when you it's and i i can't compare them because i simply don't have the numbers yeah you, you're probably thinking size of the pharmaceutical industry size of the ag industry yeah. The, I believe, I believe this is a gut feeling. Yep. No, the, 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 the ag industry is going to be in the same scale, put it that way. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's yeah. massive. Um, yeah. yeah it's absolutely, absolutely massive. And yeah. what you're saying is that companies are now innovating and they're trying to, um, sorry. So I'll just, so what you're saying is companies are innovating and looking at processes that have been taking place, that have been happening for hundreds of years, plus, 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 yep. and figuring out with the current understanding and technology, how do we make that better? So, so this ancient inoculation, maybe it's not ancient, but this old inoculation technique is now being improved by better bacteria, different bacteria, that kind of exactly. thing? Exactly. And there's a lot of investment going, going into that, that Fascinating. area. Yeah, absolutely. Because... Um, there, there's also a push, of course, uh, to move away from um, application of, uh, you could say, um, uh, inorganic uh, uh, fertilizers. Right. right? Um, is that a public push or is it a? Actually, just go around that one more time. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's a, there's a push to move away from artificial. Uh, fertilizers and um, pesticides and, and, and the like. Yeah. Okay. So that's one of the drivers for this for this new industry, um, which is it's not entirely new because you know it's, it's been around in terms of you know rhizobia inoculants and uh, inoculants for um, uh, 
for organic farming, actually, which is, is a sort of bacillus type organism, Thuringiensis, which has uh, anti insect um, or insecticidal proteins. Actually. When you buy an organic food, that means that there's no artificial or no. What does it mean in terms of the pesticides and things like yeah, that? Yeah, um, well, I think they, they're permitted to use certain things Got it. that are still. Sort of you have protected, to kind of, right? yeah, 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 because yeah. it's. For, but I, but I, yeah, I'm certainly no expert in this. So that the, 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 but there's legislation that says you can use this, yeah. this, and this, including, uh, for example, this Bacillus thuringiensis um, organism, which, Got which actually can kill insects. Um, Got it. Yeah. Um, now, whether that's cool. organic in you know a European context or a North American, I, I, I right. seriously don't know. Um, Got but you. there's burgeoning new industry there. One of the things that I was really fascinated with when I read the book Microbes and Man for the very first time was this idea that perhaps you could take this nitrogen fixing phenomenon and transfer it into cereal grains. Imagine if you could transfer it into maize or wheat, right? Because you know, that, that's where artificial fertilizers could be made redundant. virtually redundant. Yes. And this, if the, sorry, if the plants themselves are some sort of innate property. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you transfer that rhizobium type association Got it. to to maize? Or wheat? And I, I love that concept. And I actually remember talking to a school friend of mine at the time, how wonderful that would be, not without any knowledge that it would ever be possible to engineer plants. Right to do that kind of thing. Right. Here we are today, right, decades later, and it's still not achieved. It's not possible or it's not achieved? Well, it's not achieved. Got it. So um, one of the scientists actually working uh, with John Postgate in, in Sussex at the time, Ray Dixon, now at John Innes Center, where he's been for many years since the nitrogen fixation right. unit, I noticed he published a paper just about four, four years ago, three or four years ago, where they got one step closer to this uh, because it's a very complex set of genes that you need to transfer that all need to operate to get this sort of nitrogenase system working in a plant. Um, so step by step, <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. But and this is really a hard, hard problem to solve. And I, and I, I don't know how long it will take, but I, I suspect it will, you know, mankind will get there in the end. Um, the, but the, there is another, there's another way actually that's also being explored. In fact, there's a, there's a company in the UK, um, a startup company, uh, founded originally by, well, well the, you could say the foundational work was done by Professor Ted Cocking from Nottingham, right? He was actually, this is where, you know, I have this association with Mike Davy and his team who were in Ted Cocking's department. He's very famous for people in my generation who worked in the plant plant biotech. What area. makes him famous? He actually developed plant protoplast fusion to start off with. Right? So you could actually um, start to create new types of hybrid plants by fusing together okay. closely related strains or species. Okay. You know? um, and... Um, uh, but he, listen, a tr truly amazing chap, I think in his retirement, then devoted himself to working on a microbe that could fix nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen. But this microbe is free living. It does not have to form rhizobia. And it does it in cereal. Grass, ah. You know? It comes from a grass. So grass is essentially is the family which cereals and he found the bug he... well i'm not sure that i don't know the, the sort of background to mm. it but he certainly has isolated the bug got it to work wow. and now there's a company um called exotic technologies here in the uk that is developing this technology and how, how will he build that business will he he can't have patented the bug i got i've got honestly no idea no idea, but, right. no idea on that but interesting though. i just think it's just a wonderful that it is some somebody can do that it is in their, in their retirement it is it and, is and, and that's you know it's, you, that's part of our sort of microbiome um innovation community here in the uk actually um so i think that that field's got great great potential uh, one thing another thing to remember is yeah. carbon capture 
what plants do is capture carbon. They, yep. the, the microbes are catching, capturing the nitrogen in the case of these you yep. know, legumes, yep. beans. <laughs> um, plants are capturing carbon. And um, agriculture is unfortunately a major source of, um, of greenhouse gases. Plant agriculture and animal agriculture together um, contribute almost what transport does. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I would have thought the plants sort of are net. Y- you would, but... But they're not. Well, because um, we have to apply um, artificial fertilizers and the like, right? it's not all carbon dioxide, by the way. It's, it's, you know, it's nitrous oxide and, okay. and, and, and various other things that contribute to this, which are even more potent greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide but theoretically that's why you're saying i would have thought that yeah <laughs> theoretically i would have yeah. yeah we should be able to use farming as a means of capturing carbon yeah and in fact there is this term um carbon farming ah. that's coming into play whereby you view farming as a way of capturing greenhouse gases particularly carbon carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and there are people, folk, scientists around the world, working on trying to figure out what kinds of plants would do this best. Do they need deeper roots to bring carbon okay. further okay. into the soil? Right? Um, you know, and, 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 and coupled with this is this these inoculants to help enrich the soil with microbes and that can assist the process, um, that can uh, capture carbon, them, it, it be engaged in the carbon capture process itself or the nitrogen capture process itself um so there's a whole bunch of things going on that and if the economics were right that could actually lead us to thinking about farming as not only a means of producing food right but also a means of actually keeping atmospheric um uh, carbon dioxide yeah and other um types of um Greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. You want, you want tea? Yeah. Yeah, yeah go, go, we, go. Yeah. We, yeah. We'll get to the, we'll get to the animal and human stuff shortly. Fascinating. How are we doing? <laughs> yeah, we're doing very well. No, okay. this, is, this is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, very, very well. You okay? Yeah. yeah. This is, I think this is brilliant. Very, very interesting listening. I, I As I said, I'm, I promise you I'm going to go and buy a book about plants. Uh, I've become very interested recently in mushrooms right. and fungus. Yeah. Um, I read a book about mycelium networks and how vast they are across mm. the whole planet. Yeah. And then I started reading more about the medicinal properties of mushrooms, mm. not just the magic variety, although I'm extremely interested yeah. in that as a means to treat depression. And there's some companies yeah. who are developing psilocybin, mm. which is the psychoactive yes. component, if you like, or, or, or the psychoactive thing, which... Um, is in the magic mushrooms, which gives you the the, the psychedelic experience. Or in, in this case, what the companies are trying to do is a therapeutic benefit. And one of the key questions is, do the patients, or uh, yeah, it will be the patients, do they have to take a psychedelic dose? Mm-hmm. Or can they have what's called like a micro dose, where they get some sort of psychedelic effect? One of the other challenges relates to the placebo, right? right? What's the placebo control? I mean, I, I think people kind of know when they're tripping or not tripping. So I've been reading up all about that because I think it's fascinating. And then also just other mushrooms, which are not magic, but are almost magic in the sense that they contain so many organic compounds which have beneficial health promoting properties. Right, right. And there's such a vast variety of mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I was reading about people who grow the mushrooms, yes. the uh, mycologists. Mm-hmm. And all the tools and techniques that have been passed down for decades and centuries yeah, about yeah. how, and there's also some mushrooms that we just can't grow. So it's almost like the bugs that are in your gut. You, you, oh. we, we, yeah, I mean, truffles are a good example. Yeah, you have to go and hunt you, you, them out. You've the got forest. to go with the dogs and you've <laughs> yeah. got to hunt them out. And, yeah. and, that, and that's because we've never managed to, in vitro, if you like, yeah. in, in a sort of man-made environment, actually be able right. to grow truffles up. Yeah. Um, which is why they're so rare and expensive and, yes. and so on. Anyways, sorry, um, but really, really interesting stuff. And, yeah. and you've, you've opened my eyes about the world of plants, actually, in a way that I think is just brilliant. So I've actually lost track of where we were. Right. Sorry, okay. we were going to take us back in a circle to... 
Yeah, I something. I think that, it was, there, there are scientists all around the world who are that's it. trying to figure out ways in which um, it, it's going to be possible to keep more of the carbon that's captured by plants in the soil. Yes. Right? And there are techniques being developed for farming, like low-till, which is where you don't actually plough the field. You more or less scratch it. Ah. Right? Because when you plough it, you release yes. many of these greenhouse gases. Right. Um, but there's this low-till, precision, also precision fertilization. Wow. So, you know, advanced technologies to actually put uh, fertilizers right on each plant. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing things happening in agriculture. I am no expert in agriculture, but I just keep a little bit of a finger watching the brief on it. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, but nonetheless, I, I think this whole field of carbon farming is, if I might use, <laughs> excuse yeah. the pun, uh, I think it's, it's one to watch. And, and, and of course, we do have to do something about those greenhouse gas emissions coming right. from agriculture. Right. So the, there is quite some attention being paid to it now. Um, where I didn't stay in the plant, bio, plant biotech industry uh, for very long, actually. I, I think I worked in it for about seven or eight years. I, I had a wonderful time, did some fabulous work, created vectors that were completely devoid of this root-inducing phenomenon to be able to transfer genes into elite germplasm. Cool. Yeah. Um, but um, because uh, BP decided to uh, basically go more to its core business uh, at a certain point in time, I, I uh, had the opportunity with them um, to either stay in, in the UK to work on a, um, I think it was called a technical economic appraisal group, which sounded fabulous, and I thought well, that could be really nice. Uh, or I could go and work in the Netherlands uh, to develop to work in a team that was developing, together with another partner, developing enzymes for animal nutrition. And it was the beginning, it was a joint venture company that had been created. Um, and I thought, this sounds really neat, right? Yeah. Industrial enzymes, this whole technology was starting, I mean, industrial enzymes have been around actually for well over a century in a, in a sense, but not in the modern sense, right? Where you, right. Where you you know you can produce enzymes in, in large scale fermentation and you can produce exactly the proteins that you want etc. I thought this is this is another one of those sort of leading edges that I want to be on. Right. Um, so so I had the opportunity to go and live in the Netherlands with my family and work there, actually embedded in the animal nutrition company, right, which is today called Nutreco. Actually, okay. You mentioned that because BP eventually um, s s spun them off. Um, they're still going. Oh yeah, they're yeah. one of the majors in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had a wonderful time there. I was there for four years. Um, it was on the eastern part of the Netherlands, um, uh, where I lived with my family, um, and I knew nothing, nothing. I can tell you this, James, zero about animal nutrition when I went there. Um, but I could stand up in front of animal nutritionists at the end of it and talk reasonably competently. Nice, nice. <laughs> but my job was not really to be an animal nutritionist. It was because I was somebody who knew about enzymes. Um, I, it was a biochemist, geneticist, whatever. Yep. Um, it was to really figure out how could we get enzyme technology to work in animal nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> And you might think, that's weird. Why are you talking about enzymes and animal nutrition? Yeah. So it had been known for some, I think about 20 years prior to that. This was 1989. Been known for about 20 years prior to that, that if you added certain kinds of enzyme preparations into animal feed, you sometimes saw an improvement in feed efficiency body weight gain right which is what these you know, are two important things these are two important things you know, converting how much grain or sorry feed you yep. convert into meat yep. or eggs or milk or whatever right yeah so there's, there's two elements to that one yeah. one is how much you've got to give the animals and that that's a cost and and a challenge and then there's how much of and it's kind of linked how much of what you give to the animal stays 
in the animal as muscle or fat or something like that. Right? Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah. And the, yeah. the two are really yeah. joined up in a, in, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I suppose if you're running a business that's focused on uh, uh, the sort of uh, the animal itself in the form of meat or a product of the animal's metabolism in some way, shape or form like the milk, you must constantly be thinking around, well, how, how do I improve the quality of my product? How do I reduce my cost of goods? How do I make things more efficient and reduce the challenges in my supply chain, all this kind of stuff, right? And, and how do you improve animal welfare at the same time? And that's obviously fundamental as yeah, well, yeah. yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Animal health, animal yeah. welfare, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so th these enzymes have been hit and miss, frankly, okay. in the previous two decades. Um, and that's because nobody had bothered to do the science. <laughs> Right. right. Um, but there were some nice results here and there. Um, and so um, BP, or BP Nutrition, actually, as it was called, uh, had formed a, a, a R&D collaboration with a Finnish company, uh, which at the time was called FinSugar, but became Cooltor, um, to, to try and figure out, and Cooltor had um, an industrial enzyme business. So you could see where the different expertises were being pulled to try and solve this problem. Um, and my job was to be part of this team and help figure it all out. Right. Cool. And I had a wonderful boss. And that was a vision. Let's figure this out, guys. Yeah. Let's figure this out, guys. And let's make a business out of it. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. there was a, a, a sort of nascent joint venture company called FFI, um, which happened to be based in, in, back in the UK, so I was in the Netherlands, the joint the sort of collaboration partner was in Finland, and this nascent joint venture partner was back in, uh, back in it was actually in the UK. Yeah. As it um, and we were trying to figure all this out. And I had a wonderful boss at the time. What made the boss wonderful? He, well, he was such a nice chap to start with, but... It's a good start, isn't it? It's a good start, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. always a good start, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was extremely bright, um, hugely well connected with academics and, and others. So brilliant, brilliant mind. And he said to me, I want you to I want what I want you to do for the first few months here, I want you to because you don't have a background in animal nutrition, but I know you know about enzymes, right? Um, and I think he had a certain belief in me that I might be able to do something. He said, I want you to read everything there is to read, right? And nice. And figure it out, you know, figure it out, right? <laughs> so, in a nice, in, you know, really nice, nice, yeah. nice way. But I've never been asked to spend three months to read before. Um, it, you know, it, right, of course, when you do your doctoral thesis or whatever, you have to do that kind of stuff as part of it. But yeah. this was... Apart from getting to know the company and going out and visiting farms and feed mills and this kind of thing, sort of learning about the, the, the business itself, um, I was most of the time head down reading, right? Great. And I started to piece together something that was became a bit of an aha. Okay. Um, and that was... So there were various theories around how enzymes might open up feed materials and release more nutrients. So these, they were predominantly cell wall degrading enzymes, semilases, cellulases, hemicellulases, things like xylanases uh, and the like, uh, but also proteases, amylases, you know, sort of augmenting the digestive enzymes. And they were, they were adding them into feeds, um, compounded feeds fed to poultry, pigs. Yeah. Ruminants is different because obviously a ruminant is different to a monogastric right. animal like a poultry or pigs because it has it does its fermentation. Monogastric means one stomach, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So ruminants have a have a four stomach yep. rumen where they, they actually ferment. <laughs> They're very efficient fermenters. Um, and that, that's another story, but but this was for poultry and pigs. And um I figured out that, that so there were a number of theories going around um and we, we were part of a major collaboration with the rowett institute in, oh wow yeah yeah wow yeah we're close to home yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. very much so yeah very much so yeah. the route I, I would credit the rowett as being one of the yeah. places one of the birthplaces of microbiome research for yeah. sure 
Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but starting in, in animal uh, nutrition research, and particularly the rumen, the yeah. ruminant, but also poultry and pigs, there was a really big project that, that we were part of um, in the UK, um, but also brought in members from, from around the EU um, to really try and understand how these enzymes worked. Right. And that project, unfortunately, did not really deliver. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the pr overriding hypothesis at the time was that these, because they were predominantly cell wall degrading enzymes, that these were degrading the cell walls of grains and of, of, of legume, legumes, beans. So a typical, typical poultry diet is something like um, wheat and soya or... Um, uh, or um, uh, maize and soya. And so right. in the US, they typically use maize because that's what they grow there. In Europe, it's more more wheat. And in Canada, it's more wheat because you can grow wheat in, in Canada uh, cost-effectively. <clears throat> so the idea was that these enzymes were sort of blowing apart cell walls. So the enzymes were working in the digestive tract and so simply added them into the feed, made pellets out of them, and they, as they were... As they, work their way through the animal's digestive tract. They they functioned there, they opened up the cell walls and they released more nutrients. And that, that was a kind of guiding hypothesis. But there was a chap working in Saskatchewan. Um, and he he together or a professor there to working with with a postdoc. And they they'd figured out that wheat is a bit like rye in that it has a kind of a sticky polysaccharide that creates more kind of a viscosity effect right. and and um, during my sort of reading I came across this piece of work um, and started to realize that, that that might be one of the key mechanisms of action because as you increase viscosity you you start to reduce the ability of the endogenous enzymes to meet their substrates and for the reaction products i.e. Right. the break i.e. Amino acids or peptides released yep. from protein breakdown, as one example, yep. reaching the gut wall and being absorbed. Right, right. You, you know, it's, it's very simplistic. Yep. Viscosity really does impact uh, digestion. Yep, and they were able to show that there is a relationship between vos viscosity and this fee conversion. Interesting. Um, and body weight gain. Yep, uh, and therefore, you know, making the leap. Enzymes might be able might be able to assist this process because these enzymes would degrade these soluble non-starch polysaccharides, these arabinazylines. Yep. So before large. going into the animal, they do be some sort of pre. Well, actually, it can work in the digestive tract of the oh, animal. Actually. Excellent. Yeah. Um, but um, and I thought this was a fabulous hypothesis, and I, and I and I honestly believe that is actually one of the mechanisms of action. Um, but I figured out something else, and uh, you know, it was a complicated. Uh, it was a combination of different things, mm -hmm. observations, and turning, um, thinking about nutrition more in terms of the anti nutrients that were causing problems for for digestion and health. Right? So there are anti nutrition factors, and this large molecular weight. Viscous polysaccharide, you could consider to be one of those. But things like phytic acid, right, which bind um, minerals and proteins, including enzymes, right, reduce, they actually reduce the efficiency of, um, uh, of the digestion process. Um, tannins, all sorts of things, mm. protease inhibitors, all sorts of stuff you find in the grains and the legumes that we eat and animals eat. That actually interfere with this digestion digestion right. process, um, and by sort of looking at it through a side lens and reading some literature around the way in which antibiotic growth promoters work, I figured out that actually one of the basic mechanisms at play here was that these enzymes were modulating the gut microbiota, right? Right. Because you're mo modulating the milieu, right? For one thing, right. But the other observation, hypothetical at the time, right. was that if you're breaking down large molecular weight polymers of xylem, right, or rabinazylem as it's called, what are you producing? 
you're producing smaller oligo saccharides, which right. find their way down the digestive tract and feed certain kinds of microbes further down the tract. And all of this, this is only hypothesis. I published uh, uh, two papers on the topic. Um, one, <laughs> one in a very obscure place, it turned out, because I actually gave a review article on anti-nutritional factors and the role of enzymes right. at the, I think it was the American Oil Chemist Society um, conference. Okay. This was published in, in the transactions. Um, but the model that I developed about the way in which these anti-nutritional factors actually lead to indirectly or directly to damage to the gut epithet to the basically the gut barrier <clears throat> in the gut and that the way in which enzymes and other things other interventions could potentially reduce this and the balance of energy requirement and protein that model is published in that paper and i still believe it's valid today <laughs> any crossover to humans um only in the sense that this is what got me hooked on the microbiome. Okay. Got it, right. Got it, got it, got it. So we finally made it. There. <laughs> <laughs> we made it. <laughs> um, and I was so fascinated with this. And, and, and you know, and, and I, um, the second paper, by the way, was a paper called Dietary Oligosaccharides, New Insights, and actually describes this oligosaccharide part of the hypothesis in, in a bit more detail and how different enzymes might generate different kinds of oligosaccharides right. and perhaps modulated the microflora in different ways. Right. But the fact was that when you use these enzymes, you get an improvement not only in feed efficiency and body weight gain, you get an improvement in, in the overall health right. of the animals. Right. Their environment, you know, there's less ammonia in the environment. Okay. They, they, you know, Incredible. There's all sorts of benefits to, to production. Of, of poultry and pigs actually delivered by enzymes i just have to say i love enzymes <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and i but I, I always work from this point onwards with this hypothesis this this was then yeah sort of tested and yeah and shown to, to be valid um but my my main contribution actually came that was more of a hypothetical contribution if you want if you know what i mean a hypothesis uh, type contribution but um uh, my main contribution to this whole field was to work with this team this joint venture team eventually so we came back to the uk to work on this and we we can you know i think it's fair to say it might sound a little bit big-headed but i think we were the pioneers of this enzyme new enzyme business actually um because we figured out the science and so we could build credibility around that. And that enabled us to essentially create, to develop the right kinds of enzyme to do the right kinds of Got thing, it. right? Um, and, and this and, became a big thing. And this became a big, big thing. <laughs> right. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, <laughs> in a way, um, so, you know, and, and one of the other benefits, which I didn't mention, of course, is you get a, a reduced output of nitrogen and phosphorus in the manure, which is one of the, pollutants Got it. from agriculture. Got it. So these enzymes are all round. Big win. Big, big win. And then we were we were so excited by the breakthroughs that we make were making. Almost every six months we have discovered something new. Um, this is where <clears throat> when you do research and you understand the mechanisms of action, right, you get the science in your hands how this you can then turn that to help you develop the next generation of tools and products right so much more efficiently right? so these these enzymes i'll give you one example if you just mix enzymes together um and you think well the more enzyme i put in the better -uh. <laughs> <laughs> there are there's you have to use exactly the right dose oh really so, yeah the, yep just imagine what I just mentioned to you about the, the so if you start to overhydrolyze these these large molecular weight polysaccharides, you can imagine that might not necessarily be good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's these. So, so we managed to bring a nascent business to the point where we could understand how to enhance cost efficacy. Yeah, which was crucial because actually these enzymes, when we started, 
you know, it, it was actually quite challenging on a cost basis to, to get the benefit. Yep. But, you know, all of that was opened up by knowledge. Yes. By science. You know? Fantastic. And, and it's fantastic. And that, you know, modulating the microbiota was one of the key yeah. benefits of, of these things. Yeah. Uh, the, the other was then the technology, you know, producing these enzymes, which we did together with our sister joint venture uh, company. We, we all became one, one, one and the same company in the end. You merged together. Yeah. Yeah. So the technology um, was advancing rapidly. So, you know, enzyme, we could choose different types of enzyme, optimize those enzymes, yep. produce them, you know, at the right scale and efficiency and all that kind of stuff. So this sounds like it was a catalyst to help propel your career forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So t- talk to me then about um, how you eventually became the chief scientist at um, okay. point. Yeah. Right, right. Because that's the most senior scientific position in the company, right? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, scientific, you're senior scientist. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But the, the um, just to correct, yeah. a small point of correction there. Sure. I was chief scientist or chief scientific officer for Donisco. Yes. DuPont acquired Donisco. Got it. And my title was changed to chief scientist because chief scientific officer actually has a legal connotation. Yep. Right? So I'm of, the board representation. Chief, chief, no, a chief scientist of the business um, for nutrition and health. Got it. So I need to be specific about that. Got it. Because that was one of the businesses of DuPont. Got it. Yeah. I understand. Somebody else was chief scientist for yeah. DuPont. Right? And the, the, the chief scientist. So this, sci- is, this the DuPont Nutrition and Health business was a very substantial business. How substantial? Um, I can't give you numbers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very, very big. <laughs> okay, got it. No, I think it's, it's important we talk about the journey to that position. Okay. Because there'll be learnings in there for people that listen to the podcast as well. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll get into the subject of microbiome right. in, in detail. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so clearly, you know, th- this was a great success. Yes. Right? Th- th- um, and um, it was st- I was still working in the joint venture company when I think I'd been there about four years. So it was four years in the Netherlands, um, four years. And there were there were great things that came out of that during the Netherlands as well, actually. For for, you know, but I, I don't have time to go into that. Yes. Moved back to the UK, four years in the UK, and then I was asked to head up the corporate research centre uh, in Finland for, for Kulta, uh, which was a great honour. And I went to my wife in trepidation. Yes. <laughs> I just fancy moving to Finland. <laughs> um, and she said, "Yeah, let's do it." Nice, yeah, amazing. Nice. So, so we did, um, and um, the Finnish Research Center, uh, called the Technology Center, as it was called at the time, was a fantastic place uh, with really, I think, some of, some of the most outstanding scientists I've ever worked with. Actually, uh, it was a mix of um, what makes a really good scientist a good ooh, scientist, right? <laughs> People with well, deep knowledge of their subject, right? Who, who keep abreast of the literature, uh, but can apply what they learn from the literature and from their own research to create new things, always with a curious mind, always willing to try new things, going the extra mile, uh, you know, um, in just in just loving the science, passionate about the science. Right? It's not a job. It's, yeah. it's, it, it, it's yeah I mean, vocation you, it's a vocation that's right yeah when when you're in that spot that's when you that's when you can do your best work yeah right yeah, yeah. some people call it the flow state yeah that's yeah. the new the new phraseology yeah. now yeah. 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 yeah 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 so um there were lots of people there in the flow state yeah <laughs> yeah with with great capabilities and um i you know we were doing biotechnology research, we were doing carbohydrate chemistry research, um, we were doing uh, nutrition and health research, or health and nutrition as we called it, um, shortly after I went there. Um, and I was, there was something happening in, so that this whole animal nutrition area was obviously fascinating, the research centre was supporting a lot of that, a lot of that research we were doing, mm-hmm. so it was great for me to actually go there and be physically there and part of it and heading it um 
but there was there was a sort of trend emerging around human health and nutrition. I mean, I'm not saying it's it's been there a long time, but there was an industry, you know, the industry, you could say, was really seeing opportunity here, right? right? And it was a sort of just on the cusp of, and so we decided to sort of, you know, push also quite heavily in, into that area as well, so health and nutrition, and developed all sorts of models for, for studying it alongside what we've been doing in animal nutrition as well. And that, that was a fantastic time. So, and I loved it in Finland. Wonderful people, great country, just just fantastic. Then one day... They do a lot of sauna, don't they? And they do a lot of sauna. Yeah, absolutely. It's good for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very, it is, very good um, for them. They love the forest, collect mushrooms, Yeah, pick blueberries. Really? You're people, you know, I mean, they're, they're just passionate about just the environment. Yeah, you know? yeah, it, yeah. It's as... You have to uh, you have to live amongst them in a way to well maybe you don't I don't know to really appreciate that but you you're touching on that yourself about five minutes ago so this you know it, it's um, yeah it's just just it was just a wonderful experience but unfortunately I can only stay there for a few years three years why <laughs> because Danisco acquired Calter ah uh-huh. and Danisco was kind of like um, the you could say a, it was a larger you know, it's probably not quite true to say this, but there was a larger version of Coulter. Um, a lot of synergy? There was, there was um, a lot of opportunity because a lot of complementary capability, actually. So Danisco was, was actually also fairly diversified at a certain point, but it decided to focus on, on food or food and nutrition ingredients right. at the time it acquired Coulter. It acquired something else at the same time. It acquired this FFI unit because Coulter had actually fully acquired FFI. Ah. BP was no longer part of that. Yeah. FFI, functional? No, it's actually F- Fin Feeds International. Fin Feeds International. Believe it or not. Yeah. 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 Um, not functional food ingredients. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for at least um, it amuses me a little bit that the company eventually, DuPont Nutrition and Health or Neutro- DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences, as it was called in its latter state, was actually acquired by IFF. Right. <laughs> so, which is go. where it is. At yes, the indeed. Yeah. indeed. So indeed. from FFI to IFF, IFF yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd left the company before that, actually. Um, but anyway, Denisco acquires Coulter. I'm asked to move to Copenhagen. Where the headquarters is, um, but I was going to. I was saying they acquired this FFI unit, and they acquired um, half of a joint venture with Eastman Kodak called Genencore International, right? Got it. Um, which was our enzyme technology unit based in South San Francisco. Oh. Um, and eventually. We were able to bring it all together. But when I went to Copenhagen, I, w- I went there to become the vice president of innovation biosciences. So trying to stay on track with the question you asked yes. me, um, which was a fantastic honor, privilege, opportunity. Because now I, I was now um, heading up a, an organization, I think it was about 150 scientists and technicians in multiple locations, different labs. So it's starting to become a more complicated job, right. actually. How did that work? Did you get given a set of objectives from your boss and you said, right, here's my budget, here's my team, here's how I'm going to deliver? Or did you say, right, here's what I think we can deliver with the people and the capabilities and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, well, because it's an evolution in the sense that, you know, it didn't all, it was, you know, the elements of it were in place when I was asked to head right. it up. Right. So, it, you know, so that there was a continu- continuation, but of course there was also, when you do an integration, you you sort of make a new strategy in a sense because you you know out now you need to use the different Got elements um, in, in the optimal way. Um, but this this was a great job. So now I'm a vice president, innovation biosciences, um, traveling a lot now, <laughs> <laughs> remembering not to do back to back overnights, um, and it it was just fantastic because now I could start to. Um, 
learn about new things. Um, but my one, well, it would, you could say that there are two passions in my life, enzymes and microbes, right? I was still on the enzyme track at the time, and it was just fantastic because we had a fantastic group in, in you know, our new home, which we had a fantastic enzyme development group there, uh, that we were now able to combine with um, our FFI unit. Um, eventually, uh, when Genincore International became fully part of, of Danisco, uh, this was all pulled together into the powerhouse of, of enzyme development, particularly for agri-food and beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just so fulfilling, I have to say. Mm-hmm. You know, to to see the transformation of the company uh, from you know food food ingredients through to an industrial biotech right. house, and now health and nutrition is coming through, and we start to build that side of it. So, and and because <laughs> because I was so passionate about all of this, I was sort of in the thick of it. You know, um, I had the opportunity to work in the corporate venturing unit for a, for a little while. So that was working with startups, um, you know, really... Investing? Biotech startups, primarily. Yeah, investing in biotech startups. So when you were part of the investment teams then, maybe you weren't part of the investment teams, but what were you looking for in opportunities? So and What you know, made them stand out? So I, I'm always looking for... Um, you, you always have to look to make... You always have to make sure there's a business opportunity, Right. You can't do any of this if it's if it's not a business opportunity. But the other thing you have to look for is how does it fit strategically? So corporations invest strategically. Venture capitalists invest purely for financial reasons, but I'm sure they enjoy it and the technology and Indeed. everything as well. But you know that very well. Yes. So corporate venturing units have a much more strategic focus on the things that they're looking for. How does it augment what they have and how does it support their strategy? Right. So for me, it was always, of course, at the end of the day, my role uh, was really about assessing the technology um, and whether we, you know, we felt that it could deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was, you know, I was the sort of lead scientist in the team. Um, so I, I did this as a kind of stepping stone between the innovation biosciences head and then this corporate venture unit was established and I said, I want to do that. And so mm. I did that mm. and then then moved into what we call technology and business development as a v, as the VP there. And my boss, who was just such a wonderful character, also a hugely amusing chap, <laughs> very clever, um, at a certain point, decided he was going to retire. So he he was the he was basically the CTO or CSO of, of the company. Um, and at a certain point, he you know he reached the age where he felt he'd like to retire, and um, you know I was asked would I like to become chief scientific officer. Um, there was something else in between, which was um, so we were pushing hard on biotech and health and nutrition, and and. And so the health and nutrition was coming up as well in the company. Um, and and I, I was really supporting that very strongly. And because that was a strategic direction, um, I, you know, I think that was possibly one of the reasons I was asked to take on the position, which I occupied for 11 years, actually. <laughs> Can you tell me about the journey over those 11 years? I know you can't go into anything confidential, but... How did the technologies change? How did your exposure to microbes sort of increase that kind of thing? Yeah, so so there are a couple of things. Um, so the te- I mean, the technology is always advancing. Um, the um, the you know on the on the, you know, if you take the industrial biotech side of it, it's amazing how that keeps on advancing. Um, but on the health and nutrition side of things too. So we we had um, we, so the company had acquired some starter culture businesses, actually very substantial. Um, they were doing here's what you start your so the starter process culture. with, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the you know the, the the bugs or the microbes that are used to make yogurt and cheese and these cool. These primarily in, in fermented And they were things. sold to companies who made the yogurt and the cheese and that's that right. kind of thing. Exactly. Ah, exactly. Very interesting. Exactly. How were they how were they distributed in huge vats? 
because the scale of the cheese and the yogurt is so big well, as well, right? Actually, the, the containers are much smaller than that. Okay. That you distribute because they, they, you know, they, it, you know they, there are different ways of, of, yeah. of um, starting the process, but, but nonetheless, it's um, not huge. For enzymes, it is huge, huge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so but these are smaller containers. But um, so can I just ask another question? On yeah. that? So, so you, you're sending a small container of a particular bug which has been requested by the customer because they need that particular bug to make their product. And you submit it to them with some sort of analysis to say this is definitely that bug and we've quality oh, controlled it, oh, yeah. all that kind of stuff, yeah, right? All, so, that, all that stuff. So that's the business side from, from your company is, is yeah. making sure that they're getting the same product every single time and you've got all the infrastructure to make it and Absolutely. so on and so on. Absolutely. And that allows them to focus on making the cheese and you focus on creating the bug. So that's, that's the difference between an ingredient company and then a food company. Person. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But there's a synergy there because yeah. the food company needs the ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. And and the and the ingredient company needs to know about the process and needs to know about food because you, Got it. you know so you know so you have to have a pilot dairy, Got it. a pilot bakery, whatever, to, yeah. in order to be able to develop these these kinds of products. Yeah. Um, so so we were becoming more and more microbial in in a sense because now we had an industrial biotech business fully you know. Within this very substantial one within the company, and now we had a growing um, microbial business in in starter cultures, actually, um, which also took us actually into the field of probiotics, as you can imagine. Um, so, um, what I focused on for that you're talking about eleven years, yeah. yeah right? So, so initially it was so Danisco for three, and then. The rest with under Dupont because Dupont required yeah. Danisco. Um, it was, I think, largely um, a focus on well, a couple of things really on discovery R and D. Right? So, um, in du Dupont is a very science based company, long history of science and so much history. Fantastic, yeah, it's incredible, and it was an honour, honestly. I felt it was an honour and a privilege to work for them, um, in this, especially in this in this role. Um, but I, not, there's no but; it's an and. I had the opportunity to work in discovery R and D, to really look for those new things. Yeah. Yeah. Where were we going next? Right. This is always in a company like that. You have to be able to look forward into the future and say what is coming next and you have to place some bets effectively right you have to invest in in a portfolio of opportunities right some of which need to return in, in the in the near future you know in the sort of short to medium term but if you're in discovery r d these are typically in the longer term um and and i'm very comfortable in things that take a long time and will come to the microbiome innovation network in a minute <laughs> to talk yes. about yes. that because do, things do take a long time. Yes. Um, and one of the th so there's a couple of areas that I was particularly interested in that we started to pay attention to. One was next generation probiotics. Right. Um, now the microbiome is coming into view. Um, and the other was human milk oligosaccharides. Which are another microbiome. Which are another microbiome modulator yep. and yep. play an incredibly important role in nurturing the immune system and protecting the infant yes. in it, in it, as it's bred first in, in its first yes. year of life. Yes. Um, and you remember I mentioned a paper, Dietary Oligosaccharides, yes. New Insights? Yeah. I was going to ask you at that point about the microbiome, but I, and I figured yeah. we'd be coming back to it at some point. So... so in this period of time when I was able to read everything under the sun, and yeah. I continued to do that as part of my job, actually, and, and was really, I built this fantastic library. It was, you know, we, uh, even a database at that time, even though it was quite primitive <laughs> at the time. And one of the things that stood out for me there was the topic of prebiotics and then eight HMOs, human milk oligosaccharides. I'd read about, there was research being done on them, but you know they couldn't be produced as such. Yeah. But it was just fascinating to understand what they did. Yeah. And for the listener, prebiotics are non-digestible form of 
essentially fiber, isn't it? That that confers some sort of effect on the microbiome insofar as a particular group of bugs or, or even kind of more precise than that will grow and they have some health promoting property. Yeah. Is that the general gist of it? Yeah, yeah. So we can't digest it, but the bugs can. Yeah, it's, yes. it's a, it, yeah it's exactly. It's a, and they're typically small um, you know, chains of sugars that, that are bonded together in a certain way. The, our digestive tract, I, the human part of it, so to speak, or the mammalian part of it, cannot degrade. But the microbes in your gut can, and yes. not all of them, something that more selectively hydrolyzed. So they tend to favor the good bacteria, if you like, putting it simplistically over the bad. The thing about HMOs, though, which I learned very early on in, in my literature review <laughs> back in 1989, is that they have another function. And that, that is they actually mimic the sugar moieties or sugar um, molecules that sit on the epithelial cells that line the gut. Yeah? Right. They mimic them. Huh. And so what happens so the, these so when a pathogen, a nasty bacterium if you like, comes into your digestive tract, one of the things and they very often have very specific adherent molecules or proteins which actually bind to these sugar moieties. They recognize them in the bind on, so they're, and there are different types, like certain types of E. coli, uh, they bind to mannose rich um, uh, residues or moieties that are present on these epithelial cells. And they get a foothold and then they, they start to grow and, and invade, right? Um, HMOs actually basically trap the pathogens as they, as they, flow through the digestive tract, sort of falling them, if you like. Interesting. That they are the gut epithelial barrier. Ah. Yeah, and they just flush them out. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so Go in. the other thing that they do, which you were talking about, James, is that they feed a selective population of bacteria in the gut and are especially favorable to protecting the young infant. Right. Um, protecting it against uh, pathogens again, but also, they have an effect on the immune system. Right? They, they, it's actually, it seems that there's a requirement for establishing a, um, a typical, a, a, a certain type of microbiota in the infant gut to help the immune system develop in the right kind of way. If you don't do that by, you know, if you, through an antibiotic intervention or um, if, you're, if you're born by a C-section and not breastfed, Right? If you're not breastfed um, at all, you might develop a, a different kind of microbiota and your immune system might not develop in, in a way that it's able to tolerate certain types of allergens and the like. There's even a link to uh, obesity, actually, through, you know, antibiotic interventions has been linked in, in childbirth has been linked to... Uh, to obesity. I mean, of course, you know all these things, James. But I, th I think it's truly fascinating. And HMOs play a crucial role. In it. It's the third major component in human breast milk. Um, and when I wrote the paper Didn't know that. in dietary, this paper, a small review, together with some very notable colleagues, actually, I speculated that, you know, if ever we could produce these things, they would make such an such an important difference to people's lives i hope <laughs> that would be the hope um because also they could potentially be used for, for adult right. therapeutic purposes and they're, they're, they are being explored for that yeah, yeah. anyway the technology exists now to produce these at scale how do we produce them they're produced through fermentation right <laughs> that good old process that yep. we talked about yeah on and off throughout yeah so they're produced through fermentation you can produce them through chemical synthesis, but fermentation is the preferred route. Got it. And a whole variety of these types of HMO are produced by different companies around the world today. Um, and um, yeah, so I, you know, my journey into microbiome, you know, what as I said, started with Agrobacterium rhizogenes and how it worked with the plant host. Yeah. It then became a little bit more complex microbiome with animal nutrition, and then. 
this whole field of human health and nutrition, particularly starting with the infant, I found fascinating for quite some years. Right. And I had the privilege and, prev- uh, and pleasure, actually. It's always a pleasure to work as, uh, as, as chief scientists, kind of able to steer um, and guide yeah. and, and bring people together to work on these very interesting challenges and problems and opportunities. And, and, and the next generation probiotics side of it led to us establishing a um, what we call our microbiome venture or human microbiome venture, uh, which is uh, which was launched, I think, in 2017. Um, okay, with that. with that ambition of, of really going to, you know going to the next level, and, and you know it's not all about microbes per se, but it's about you know microbiome, um, different kinds of microbiome modulating opportunities, if you like. I can't say say much more about that, but but again, it was a, it was again a great um, uh, pleasure, and I'm really proud of the fact that we established that unit. Actually. When you say next generation probiotics, what what does that mean versus sort of the well, older generation? It it means actually looking at the take, taking the new tools of discovery, right to to find out which of the microbes. So, Probiotics have developed, in a sense, from from uh, from the from the dairy industry originally, right? So the lactic acid bacteria type probiotics, yep. but next generation probiotics could be anything that that actually confers a health benefit that is based on what what I like to call microbiome science, and that we have published together, James, in our strategic roadmap, indeed, um, on on this topic. So today we can talk about microbiome science. Yes. Um, and this is this and this is what your podcast series is all about, of course. Indeed, um, I think this is a you know it's a long journey. It will be a long journey, but certain milestones are being hit. Everything takes possibly twice as long as you think it will. Yeah, <laughs> because there are always hurdles. There's so many difficulties and challenges. Indeed, but the microbes that live in us and on us. Play such a profound role in our health and in disease. It's a balance, of course. Um, we there are opportunities here to really significantly affect new therapies and prevention of disease. Um, to bring new, I mean, another thing that I often think about and I'm very interested in is how do you use nutrition in a more um, uh, therapeutic way, right? Alongside, alongside drug therapies and the like, because there's so much evidence that nutrition, which obviously impacts the microbiota, there's plenty yeah. of evidence for that, but nutrition can actually improve your chance, your, your, the outcomes for, from therapeutic treatments. Yes. Right? So use them hand in hand. Indeed. And I, this is I, moving more back into your space. Yes, now. not really. No, no, no. You, <laughs> uh, not so at all. I think um, you've had so much exposure to the different types of microbiome technologies. You've got a, an incredible broad understanding, I think, of all the various different types of microbiome therapy. And we're going to get onto that now, I think. But I just want to ask you a question. Do you think that maybe we should be describing nutrition slightly differently? And you have nutrition for you, and then you have nutrition for your microbiome. Yes. Yeah? yeah. And, and, you know, given that we can't digest some of the things that we put in our body but the bugs can mm-hmm. maybe there's a different way of thinking about nutrition you know yeah. this is for you this is for your microbes i, I don't know so yeah early concept <laughs> yeah yeah and, and of course there are um yeah i, I you know I, you could say in a way we have been working in that space through the use of, of, of prebiotics in particular yeah right the, the prebiotics are clearly nutrition for the microbes for sure um uh, and HMOs, uh, uh, and nature's natural prebiotic, if you like, uh, prebiotic. You know, put a big plus on that because they, they do so many other things. Can we, for the can we get HMOs now off the shelf? Yeah, or we can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you can just go on Google and, and get some. put it in, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can actually. Because one of the things about the probiotics, I guess, is that the old generation probiotics, the lactobacillus, just as an example, the bifido, they've not really kind of done it you know, from a kind of health promoting effect type uh, analysis. Right. So um, I don't know exactly what you mean. Yeah. But I think you, 
you have to take a step back and ask yourself, have I actually done that analysis? Mm. Have you done that analysis, James? Of every single study? Yep. I have not. Or, or even of uh, studies that were done at good clinical practice level versus other kinds of studies? I would... Maybe products without studies. Right. You know? So I think it's really important uh, to, yeah, to consider that not all, pre all probiotics in the market are the same or have the same sort of scientific um, basis or, or documentation associated with them. Right. Um, so... Are there lots of companies though man manufacturing, distributing and selling the same strain but for different things with different levels of evidence underpinning them based on what they've generated? So, yeah, to some degree. Yeah. 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 Um, but it can be different quality of the strain based on how it's produced, how many viable ones are in there, the stability, that kind of yep, thing. Yep, and there are very, many companies doing this. Um, but I, I would ask you to, to look and pay attention to, to the different types of products and the different level of scientific documentation backing them. Mm. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is, and, and push back on me, some probiotics you believe have a robust enough evidence base. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But they're not drugs because they're not for the treatment of a disease. Exactly. They just promote some sort of health benefit. Yeah, and yeah. What, what kind of benefits are there? Well, I think um, uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea is one area yeah. where I think there's a meta-analysis out there. There is. Which, which is quite, I think, quite compelling. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's, one, that's just one, yep. one, one example. And to be fair, if someone said to me, James, what probiotics should I take? And I say, well... Depends what you're telling, what you're asking me to take it for. You know, if you've had a course of broad spectrum antibiotics, mm. or you've had diarrhea as a result of some sort of food poisoning, or as a side effect of something else like antibiotics, mm. I would say you should try a probiotic, mm. particularly one that contains more than one strain. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm aware of the evidence you're talking about, actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess. One of the criticisms of the probiotics industry more generally, mm. um, it's not a specific criticism for me, I think it's more just in common parlance, is there's very variable quality in terms of the evidence, but also quality of the product because there's less stringency. This, this, is, um, this is unfortunate, um, but it, yeah, it, it, it is the case. Um, and that's why you need to look the evidence and the companies producing the high quality products with a lot of scientific documentation yeah relative to those that might not be doing the same mm. right and and you know shelf life stability and all those kinds of things are crucially important too do you think that um you have to speak in broad terms i think because i'm conscious you might be conflicted in some respects because of what you did previously but some of these companies might transition from the probiotic product to the live biotherapeutic product which is the medicinal product that has to be run to GCP, so good clinical practice, probably some sort of statistical significance with a robust set of endpoints. And so this will be where you'll see um, the, um, you know, the ones that are serious about the yes. science actually um, move ahead of yes. those that have not even not done the science or, or uh, uh, you know, have, have limited science to support their products. Got it. Yeah, um, but I think that you know th there are a number of cases. I mean, I go back to the infant, for example. Yes. There, there are studies. You asked me about you know antibiotic associated diarrhea is one example with yeah. good meta analysis. We know that you require certain types of microbes as an infant, right, in order to be able to utilize those HMOs, right, and establish this. Actually, it's, it's, it's interesting because the infant has a almost a dominant microbiota or a microbiota dominated by certain bifida bacteria right. for a period of his life. That's it. Breastfed infants. Is it called B. infantis, something like that? Bifidobacterium longum subspecies infantis yes. is, is actually one of those, is one of those um, uh, microbes, absolutely. Um, but there are others. Yeah. But, there, yeah. but it, you know, there's an example where, you know, um, we know that there are certain lactic acid bacteria 
that actually provide that kind of benefit. There are, there are lactic acid bacteria that um, are used as probiotics uh, already, actually, with mother-infant. Right. Um, where, in fact, there's quite a long-term study in New Zealand on um, the effect on atopic dermatitis. Cool. Yeah, in a, in a, in a cohort there. They had reduced incidence if they were taking the probiotic. Very significant. Like yeah. 40%, almost 40%. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, there are a number of examples of good studies. Yep. Um, you know, good good products, yep. good companies. Um, and, you know, so I would actually even request yes. that those that are kind of sometimes, and you're not being here, James, I know that, but some are sometimes dismissive of probiotics when they haven't actually assessed the evidence as such. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And one of the great things about this podcast is I speak to people with different views. Yeah, yeah. I'm really happy you're pushing back a little bit, um, and and it's going to be good for the listeners to hear as well. Yeah. So, so there's a a request and ask to explore more in yeah. the way of evidence. And yeah. I think in some respects, it's our job to make people aware of that. Mm. And it's our job, my job as a host, to make sure that we have a balance of opinion. Uh, relating to these really, really important yeah. topics. So I'm, I think it's brilliant, brilliant. So let's talk about the KTN. Yeah, fantastic. Because you, you've sort of retired, but you're keeping very busy. You're also an entrepreneur in residence yes. at, a, at a university helping yeah. entrepreneurs, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, create, budding entrepreneurs. Create yeah. companies and, yeah. and, and help take innovation from the academic setting into a viable business, essentially. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I... The way I like to put it is, I retired from full time employment right. at the end of two thousand nineteen. Yeah, um, and 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 now I do a number of things. Principally, I'm chair of the KTN, which is Knowledge Transfer Network. If those out there don't know what yep. that is, KTN Microbiome Innovation Network. Yeah, uh, and we've been running for what is it three years? I think now roughly, roughly actually yeah. almost roughly. Almost, yeah. Um, that's one of the things I do. And then the other is a Royal Society Award to be an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Exeter. Um, you enjoying I'm, that? I'm enjoying that yeah. immensely. Yeah. I enjoy both things, actually, yeah. a lot. So I'm sort of semi-working, not semi-retired. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so and still immersing myself in science, which yes. I love. You know, that's fantastic. And um, so I, I became chair of this, what was what we called the special interest, or the KTN called the Microbiome Special Interest Group back in, the, I think it was the end of 2019, we launched it officially. Um, and, and James, you were you were part of that and have been on the advisory board. Uh, and we have many members on our advisory board, actually. We have very good people from industry and academia. Uh, and um, the, the KTN um, really gave us the opportunity to bring the industry voice uh, to the research councils um, really around this topic of the microbiome. And that, in a nutshell, is what we've been doing. So, uh, And for the listener, the research councils are government-funded institutions in the UK yeah. who deliver funding for researchers. Exactly. Is that the essence of it? That's the yeah. essence yeah. of it. Okay, good. <laughs> so... Um, I remember, um, I'm not sure you were at the very first meeting when we were kind of just sort of... Scoping. Scoping, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, I do remember having a conversation there where, where we we felt that the science was pretty good in the UK. Um, we weren't sure we were really delivering on, on the innovation. Right. right. Really translating that science into business. Right. Uh, that, that, was, that was almost, a, I mean, there must have been about 20 of us sitting around the table. Um, and I think that was what most of us agreed was the case. Yeah. Um, so we set about writing something we called our strategic roadmap or strategic microbiome roadmap, um, which we published uh, eventually at the beginning of 2021. And you, you, you wrote a fabulous chapter there, James, uh, on IMT. IMT, indeed, yeah. Yeah. In the intestinal microbiota yeah. transfer. Indeed. Uh, I'm trying yeah. hard to move us away from the fecal microbiota transfer. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, I think IMT is more representative of what it actually is. Yeah. We do need to continue to revise the nomenclature. And, and I'm, I'm at the moment uh, tasked 
by myself, actually, I have to say, um, with finding a name for the industry developed IMT like, but differentiated in so many different ways, therapies in which yeah. you, you take the starting material, which is a donation. Yeah. You subject it to some sort of industrial process or it's, it's, but it's still minimally manipulated maybe, or it's manipulated. I don't know. Yeah. And, and you end up with something. Yes. And it's that something that I'm looking for in terms of a definition. Okay. Um, yes. Maybe, right, maybe it will come, come to me at some point. Yeah. But I think the, the, the IMT is a medical procedure. It's not a product per se. Right, right. Because right? IMT yeah, yeah. involves yeah. the administration of something. Whereas um, the, the product is it, you know, yeah. you, you know, yeah. it, and, it, and it forms part of, you know, I guess an administration at a later date. And you, you did have a term, actually, that you, I think. A whole ecosystem, I think, is, is, is a term I used. Yeah. Whole ecosystem, there was also donor derived and there was also intestinal microbiome yeah. medicinal product there yeah that, that was the one yeah. all sorts of yeah. things like that yeah. and i, and I yeah. haven't yet arrived at something that i feel totally satisfied yeah. with i yeah. have to say yeah. but it's an evolution yeah. you know and we refine and we tweak and we get better um so that's a task i'm working on at the moment sorry we realized we had good it's science in the uk but we didn't have i guess look put it this way nobody around the world was saying Right, the UK is just by far the best. Everything to do with the microbiome. Yeah, that's it. Is it exactly, that's it to, to capture it in a nutshell? Absolutely. And yeah. there's there's a variety of reasons for that. One, the research councils, perhaps then less so now because we're seeing good big ticket funding coming through, maybe didn't recognise the importance of the microbiome and mm -hmm. perhaps hadn't recognised how strong the UK was. Yeah. So that's one element. Another element is that there was a relatively less developed industrial landscape yes. and that industrial landscape relates to i guess the big big players big mm -hmm. pharma mm -hmm. but also other large corporations who have interests in all the things you've been talking about today yep. been brilliant then you've got the maybe small to mid cap companies who are listed mm -hmm. and then you've got biotech if you like yeah yeah and compare us to say france and the usa we not strong, you know, less companies created, less funding raised, less assets and late stage development, all that kind of thing. But I think that, that that is how we described it in 2019. Indeed. And 2020. Indeed. I, I do actually believe. So we, we need have, an update, don't we? Yeah, yeah. we do need yeah. an update yes. because things have moved. They have. Right? So first of all, we published our strategic roadmap uh, for the microbiome in the, at the beginning of 2021. Um, and I'm really pleased to say, and you've just, mentioned it yourself really that has been taken up very positively right by, by the by ukri and the research councils etc we've got very positive feedback on, on what we what we we, we described this this landscape yes. we described all the opportunities and we made certain recommendations um i do think in more uh, we've done we've done a couple of other things one we did the landscape map which was um, yes. really to describe all the institutions, universities um, and institutes, as well as all the companies involved in microbiome research and development in the UK, and to make it accessible. Um, this is actually online, and anybody can tap into it. Just put microbiome landscape map into, you can put KTN, but I don't think you even need to do that, into, the, um, into Google and, or whatever other browser you might be using mm -hmm. and <laughs> um and then you, you'll find this fantastic tool that can give you access uh, to what's going on in the uk even even projects are listed there that are being run but i but uh we more recently we've undertaken a new report for innovate uk ah. where we went to another level of detail and another level of recommendations mm. And we started to realize, well, we realized this certainly in our, our first report, the strategic roadmap, that the science in the UK is absolutely top-notch around microbiome. The UK is actually, if you do um, uh, scientific literature search, look for high-impact publications, etc. Right. Um, and even on the IP side, we are scoring very, very high. Yeah? 
We're right up there. Fantastic. Yep. We have been working. I, on... I, I did not know that. Okay. So, so the, that is great. Yeah. That is fantastic. We, so good. I, I'm very confident to say these days we're a world leader in microbiome science. You know? The question then is, are we a world leader in microbiome innovation? Ah. And the answer to that actually is probably yes. So recent data actually coming from France. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we know that France France has a very, we, we both know this, yes. France has a very special history in the field of microbiology, food and health. Right? Yes, it, it, it does. You know, Pasteur Institute and Mechnikoff and, you know, the whole history of, of France's development of microbiology, was it was a natural winner in this new field of microbiome. They did a study there and reported the, you know, where by, by actually number of candidates that are being explored. I don't know whether it was by entering the clinic or maybe just in preclinical and clinical uh, studies. But based on candidates, either in preclinical or clinical studies, uh, the UK came out fourth in the world, which I didn't think was too bad. <laughs> the... U.S. of course is there. France is there. Is third. China. South South Korea. South Korea. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, not unbelievable. No, nope, you're right. Hats off. Right. I mean, I'm just back from Bio Europe, and there was a few companies yeah. from South oh, Korea right. there. Yeah yeah. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. So we're fourth, and in a good fourth. We're not like a distant fourth. Fantastic. So we're we're we're, we're moving. And I, I know the kind of things you've been doing with antibiotics is addressing one of the gaps that we we actually had, I think, in the UK, but we don't, with this development, have so much now, uh, which is on the manufacturing yes. side of things. I think yes. that's the room. GMP certification. Congratulations. Thank you very much. GMP certification. Yep. I think we, you know, that was one of the things two years ago, right? Where we said well, we have a big gap. We we yeah. would always ha always have to go somewhere else yeah. to produce. Right? Yes. Um, but there's, now, there's no yeah. reason why we can't in the UK be the best in the whole world yeah. Yeah. at um, microbial manufacturing, if you like, or yeah. uh, you could go even broader, mm -hmm. actually, you know, yeah. pharmaceutical manufacturing or LBP manufacturing, yeah. anything yeah. like that. There's yeah. no reason why we, yeah. we we can't be, and we should be, mm. we should be. We need to find ways to build more infrastructure, build yes. more capability. Yeah. I strongly believe that you have to take some risks and you have to put money down. Yep. And perhaps build before it's all there and 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 ready yeah. uh, in terms of uptake from the product side. But but that w we need to do that yeah. if we want to be the company who's doing the most in the way of microbial manufacturing. Because yeah. drugs are going to move to phase two, phase three commercial, yeah. and they're going to go right. Okay, where am I doing my next study, or yeah. where am I going to um, essentially get my commercial supply from? Yeah. Yeah. And if we're not there operational, yep. ready to go, fully certified, amazing staff, and yep. a track record, yep. people are going to go elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so I, you know, I'm very excited by the developments at Enterobiotics. Um, we we have a, I mean, we, we know COVID, COVID showed, showed the world how great yeah. we are running clinical clinical trials. Oh, absolutely. The whole health service setup that we have. Absolutely. We can run them. We can you know, we can go at pace. Um, so we, we have a first class setup there, actually. And that's one, one of our, you could say, points of differentiation. Indeed. Think, to, compared to some other, other countries. So how do we become the best? How do we become number one? Right. So <laughs> so we've made some recommendations yes. in our um, in our strategic roadmap. And we've made more recommendations, more specific in the Innovate UK report, which is not yet published, but will be in, in the next few months. Um, I can't go into those right now because they're still under Slug yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but um, in general terms, you know, right? We 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 need to. One of the things the UK is 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 where we're a little bit different to some other places. Is we a lot of our research in this field is dispersed across quite a number of re, you know many <laughs> many universities and institutes. So you find really good science in many different places. Um, what we need to do is somehow try and bring that together, aggregate it, and use that sort of scaling effect to work on taking us to the next level. Yeah? And this is what the, the, that's the nub of it, really. 
because otherwise institutions will work in silos. Of course, they form their own specific collaborations. But if you are an institution and you have fantastic, let's say, uh, sequencing set up, right, um, uh, you know, somewhere like the Quadrant Institute, for example. Indeed. Right? Um, do you have equally good metabolomics expertise, right? Um, do you have equally good microbiology, per se, right? Possibly not all in the one, one place, right? Wherever you look. But if you actually look at it collectively, we have everything. Yeah. And if only we can sort of join it up. So we, one of the recommendations we made, which might sound a bit superficial, but I actually think it will make a big difference, um, just as sort of to get us into a new space, into a new place, would be to establish a microbiome network of networks. And that is where we do try and join things up much more effectively. And, and when we say we, of course, we as such cannot do this. We can catalyze, we can recommend, but at the end of the day, it has to be the research councils that do this. Um, and I actually have high hopes that we will be able to do this eventually. Now, that will be one step. Then there are infrastructure gaps, or have been. One was to have a GMT-certified production facility for, for new kinds of live biotherapeutic bio product, yep. Yep. Um, which I believe with your investment for sure. in antibiotics, for sure. probably filling that gap. Now, yep, I think we can, we can take a box. I mean, <clears throat> I guess we're not a CDMO, but no. there's still... Definitely evidence now that can be put forward to somebody yeah. or any interested party to say it has been achieved. Yeah. yeah exactly. uh, obviously we're really excited about it. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think I think it is yeah. the first in the UK for an orally administered product yeah. that's been licensed by the MHRA and and we believe it's the most advanced facility of its kind in Europe. You know, right. we, we invested in the, the state of the art infrastructure. Um because we believe in the future of the product. Yeah. And we believe there's going to be increased demand. Absolutely. And uh, we don't want manufacturing to be a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. We want to control the supply chain, mm -hmm. control our own destiny. And and a key thing for us is actually retaining the know-how and building up yeah. a, a, a huge library of carefully curated know-how. Because right. it's that coupled with the harder IP in the form of patents mm -hmm. that brings you to that microbiome center of excellence yes. type type level. Totally. Um, totally. So, so that's always been part of my vision and I'm, I'm really thrilled that we've executed on it. Yeah, and it's, it's a special feeling going inside of a facility that started off as nothing yeah. and is now a living, breathing, GMP certified Absolutely. Um, capability that will very shortly be manufacturing product that's going into patients and making them feel better. It's just, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Just yeah, Wonder, it, it, wonderful. It's, it's fantastic. But we need more. We need, we need we more do. and we need bigger facilities, yep. commercial scale facilities. And if we're not going to build uh, in a kind of CDMO capacity, there has to be, in my opinion, to really propel uh, the UK forward incentives for companies who are going to make the investments into their own capability. Mm which we want to do. Yeah, that's we another want, way of doing it. We want Absolutely. to do it in antibiotics. Yeah. We don't want the manufacturing to be elsewhere. Yeah. And, I, and I certainly don't want to, I guess, under the auspices of antibiotics, have to build manufacturing elsewhere. Yeah. You know, I want it to be in Scotland good, uh, good. really badly. I'm yes. sure you can tell in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really, really want it to be in Scotland. The investor base is aligned to that. Um, but uh, there really should be some sort of incentive for us to do it because, yeah. yeah. you know, bricks and mortar is not mm. typically what an investor wants to be putting the money mm. into in a biotech company. No. They want the R&D, yeah. you know, they yeah. want the, the data. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm um, no, no, taking no, a sign of no, no. this is, I mean, this It's is important one, though, right? It really yeah. is important. So that, that was, that's one area that's, you know, with a big spotlight on it where there is, where there's great advance, right? We're still not there yet as such, Yes, but there's great advance. Um, Another area that we're looking at is the KTN Microbiome Innovation Network um, advisory board. That is, yes, uh, is is biobanking. Um, ah, so well, it's a combination of standards and biobanking. So, on the standard side, the, um, the field of the microbiome is, is still challenged by the fact that um, you know sampling, sample analysis, reporting is still not standardised. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's important it because is important. 
any of the steps yeah. could be, I guess, driving whatever difference there is between two different studies or Absolutely. two different. Yes. So if we're going to share, you know, if we're going to actually be able to interpret this massive amount of data yeah. that's coming from these kinds of studies, um, collectively in a sense, as as a community, yeah. we have to be able to do things using mm-hmm. certain standards. The the other area which I'm pretty excited about is is biobanking, where um, we'd like to do something, at least the concept is, we'd like to do something a little bit closer to what UK Biobank does for, yeah. for tissues um, on the microbial side. This would be cool. Yeah. Um, and we, we're currently working on that. We haven't issued a report yet, but it's coming. Yep. Um, but that, that could, again, you know, because you always have to look for, you know, point of differentiation. What is it yep. that we can do collectively, um, you know, to give us an edge in a certain area? Yeah. And I think that could very well be one because you know, given the experience with UK Biobank, right, we can learn from that. Yeah. And, and, and that is, a, uh, UK Biobank is used globally. Yeah. Yeah, it it is absolutely a leadership position yep. for the UK. Can we do something similar for microbiome biobanking? So would we have an institution established? Yeah, that, that, that'd be nice. We we we'd need, but you know, we, we're working. Well, we have. We need Wellcome Trust or BBSRC to hopefully but, write a big check. <laughs> well, if they're listening, guys, that sounds very important. <laughs> well, that, Get that checkbook ready. <laughs> no, but so, seriously, what that that's very interesting. So there's a precedent if you like not for microbial banking but biobanking yeah mm. well there's lessons to be learned there isn't there and, and that's probably Certainly. a good thing going to these yeah funding councils yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah now now of course the ktm microbiome innovation network is both is it's not both it actually covers human animal and plant so we're rather ambitious here in that we'd like to be able to bring all up now of course reality is that microbiome research investment is, is much higher in the human mm. area than it is in the other Indeed. two. Um, but um, again, if we can sort of leverage from one to the other by bringing the communities together through this network of networks, we will at least be able to edge towards a, a higher level right, of overall, um, I would say, impact. Because the impact we're talking about, isn't it? Impact in the, in the sphere of, of microbiome. Um, for entrepreneurs, they need to know where to go to get support, right? Not just financial, right? Typically, you know, they can find seed funds or, you know, lo- lo- you know the, in- the investors that sort of help get things going, help get yeah. things going around certain universities or the yeah. like. Um, but they need guidance. They need to know how do you approach this area, right? They need to know how do they protect IP. So basics, actually, how do you protect IP? They need to know about Nagoya. They need to know about the regulatory side of things, which is not straightforward. It, Stop. <laughs> you know better than I do in that. Well, uh, when I started, I knew uh, I, well. I knew nothing about nothing. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know anything. No, I believe that. <laughs> I, I, no, seriously, I, I I really didn't know anything. Um, but I, I actually didn't really know anything. But what I did know was that the microbiome was very important, and that there were maybe billions of people on the planet who could benefit through improvement to the microbiome that could be delivered through a drug product yeah. or something like a probiotic, which is over the counter or a prebiotic, yeah. or maybe at a more fundamental level, just really good diet, yeah. right? And yeah. nutrition. Yeah. But I believe that so strongly that my conviction and desire essentially just allowed me to gather momentum and, and I was learning so intensely mm at the same time as moving things forward, it just kind of worked out and it just kind of happened. Yeah. I think if you want something badly yeah. enough yeah. and you've got enough belief in um, your mission and your vision, then you can make it happen. But, but also, you, I think some have, some are natural entrepreneurs. Right. right? I think you're one of those, actually. Right. <laughs> uh, who has the energy, drive, conviction yeah. just to do these things? Others, others just need a bit more support. Indeed. Right? Um, and it, it, it would, one of our recommendations actually that we did make in the strategic roadmap um, was that you know, it would be useful to have some sort of innovation hub kind of set up where you could go for this kind of support. Yeah. Um, we're not there yet, but what I have seen since we started over you know, three years ago 
you're seeing the needle moving in oh. the right direction. Fantastic. Yeah? So we'll have to wait to see what actually transpires because yeah. at the end of the day, I want to be able to look back and see that we did something impactful. Right? 100%. I'd, yeah. I'd like to think we can turn our, if, you know, hopefully on the human side, that comes sort of earlier. But on the plant side and animal side, can we do something similar? Yes. Yeah. So this this whole topic of carbon farming, I find fascinating. And microbiome is quite you know, one of the key components of that. Soil microbiome or plant microbiome. Mm-hmm. There, there are, if you don't not aware of this, those listening, you know, there are microbes that live in plants, actually right. in plants and do good things for plants. Right. Yeah. Not just on plants or in the soil, they live in plants. You might think that a plant is sterile, but it's not. It's actually no. hosting many different kind of microbes living in a symbiosis for mutual benefit. Yeah. So, you know, could we, we we talked earlier about carbon farming. Could that be? Could that yes. be something? And you know, can we do something more for these different sectors? Um, yes. in, in the same way that I think we're starting to move the needle for the human health sector. Fantastic. Um. Andrew, we've been speaking for quite some time. You've probably lost track of time. Um, uh, it'd be great to get you back on, maybe once the report's been published. Mm-hmm. Um, we can talk more about the future-looking aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Well, um, we can leave it there. And I want to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Really, it has. It's been thank you very much. For me too. Thank you, thank you very much, James, for inviting me on. It's great talking with you. Thank Fantastic. You. Cheers. <laughs>